Hello, kids. This is Ryan from the Dead Radio Podcast. Please excuse me while I get these plugs out of the way. Please subscribe to the Dead Radio Podcast on iTunes, Beyond Pod, or whatever your mobile podcast app preference may be to download and listen to the show on the go. Not sure how to do that? Go to our YouTube page by searching Dead Radio Podcast and watching the lovely video Adam posted to teach you dummies how to figure it out. You might as well subscribe to the channel as well while you're there. We're also on Instagram at Dead Radio Podcast and on Facebook as well. Facebook.com slash Dead Radio Podcast. If you'd like to support the show, send us a few shekels at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Dead Radio Podcast. Your support will help to enhance. 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 The show and fund future Dead Radio projects like Tim Cop, a live chili cook off and a shot-for-shot remake of Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. We do this show for fun, but as Danny DeVito and Twins once said, Well, money talks and bullshit walks. We also share the internets with other local podcasts. So check out Dark Side Records Podcast, Dork Side at Dark Side Podcast, Hudson Valley Legends Podcast, and Hudson Valley Transmitter Podcast. And as always, the Dead Radio Podcast is sponsored by Track 7 Studios, providing quality artistic photography and video services for advertising or events of any size. They will photographify anything. And if anybody has been paying attention, I just said the word podcast 13 times. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. This is the latest disclosure in a report from National Civil Defense Headquarters in Washington. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life. Welcome to Dead Radio. We're not doing that. How did she come to have sex with the dead man? Don't call me Radio Unit 91. You're a dead man. You're a dead man! He's got here in this radio station. The place where the dead speak. Rebel Radio! I'm a fake? Yes. How'd you like to be dead? You ever think about doing radio? My team, my team is dead! But you're not crazy. You're me. And this is just radio. By the powers vested in me, by the Federal Communications Commission, I command you to get on the microphone in a serious manner and continue this broadcast. All right. That was the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Great sound collage. <laughs> Thank you. That's a little dead. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, welcome That's back, everyone. I'm not usually the producer either. I'll so fade you. I'll fade you down and just kill it, and I'll make it. I'll make all it all right, work I'm already for fading you. it down. Oh, okay. What are you doing? There you go. Sounds great. All right. <laughs> all right. Episode 126 off and running. Ah, I wasn't supposed to use that. No. Sorry. Hi, everyone. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had teasers for the last couple weeks, and last week we finally like dropped the dropped the big bomb. Because we couldn't actually believe you were going to show up. Yeah. <laughs> and here you are. We were <laughs> nervous that you weren't going to show up, and we're like super excited that you guys are here. Uh, for anyone who's just joining us, we have uh, Magus Peter H. Gilmore and Magister Dr. Robert Johnson from the uh, the Church of Satan. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, right here that from Poughkeepsie. Okay. Yeah, from yeah. Poughkeepsie, yeah. New York. We <laughs> have been we've been talking about trying to reach out to you guys for years, but we're super not motivated sometimes, and we forget stuff. Like that's written on the wall somewhere over yeah, there. Yeah, in red. Um, we yeah. wanted to well, <laughs> hell, <laughs> hell froze over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah um, episode uh, we're on one twenty six now. Episode uh, seventy eight. We um, were researching an article about the. Um, um, I know I don't know what your affiliation to these guys are, but the, the Satanic Temple uh, was nothing it? to do with them. Okay, <laughs> that's what I figured. However, posers all. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, they we'll did something super. That. We did. They did something super funny, which uh, we thought was great, and then that led us into researching you guys and finding out that you're based here, which yeah. is pretty cool. Well, you know that yeah. they're they're like JV, so mm-hmm. you know that whole <laughs> yeah. thing. Yeah. That's, that, that's what. That's well, about. the thing that they were doing was just uh, starting an after-school Satan program because yeah. they were, you know, apparently in. Um, what what state notice, was that again? And you you notice what that acronym spells? After school 
Satan. Oh, ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, the, the, the county or the state or something basically passed the law that said religious groups could solicit in schools. So they said, well, if you're going to let Christians do it, you got to let us do it. So yeah. it was upheld in their in their Supreme Court. And, and us, in our ignorance, yeah. you know, found our way to you guys. <laughs> and then we're like, oh, this is much better. And they're <laughs> local. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we've so, been around for a while. Uh, how yeah. come uh, now? Why Poughkeepsie? I just I have to know why. Well, Poughkeepsie. You know, I've lived in lived in Manhattan for thirty five years in okay. Hell's Kitchen, of course. <laughs> uh, my wife was even born there, uh, but uh, we decided to get a house. You know, my wife was retiring from where she worked, and we thought uh, we have a good friend here, Joe Netherworld, who actually lives up the block from us, and his house is known as the Halloween House, mm-hmm. and people uh. have been going there for for forever. He's been there for another 16 or so years more than we have. Is that the purple one? His is sort of, yeah, magenta and black and, and, it's and got green all and the stuff. Cool, uh, the vines and... Yeah, um, yeah. It, yeah. It looks very bayou there. That's wild. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that house. It's cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we came and visited him and uh, we walked around and saw this amazing house up the block, even though it was beige. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> uh, you know, we thought, damn, that looks like a Charles Adams drawing. So um, not that long after, we decided we were going to look for a house, and that house came on the market. And it had since been raided by uh, the police and uh, because it was full of squatters, mm-hmm. and most of the windows and doors had been bashed, and it was boarded up. So, so this, it was a fixer-upper. Oh, yeah. Y- yeah, yeah. Well, the, the dining room was a meth lab. Oh ah. wow! So uh, and we we did we didn't keep it. So. Oh, we have our say. own sources of income, so <laughs> we really didn't need that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it became like we had to do everything from scratch. Uh, the house is on the national register, and it's one that uh, needed like everything done. And yeah. we, it took like five years alone just to fix all the plaster work Jesus. in the house. And we kept the plaster. We didn't go mm-hmm. to sheetrock. We really wanted it to be restored to its mm-hmm. original glory, so we had to rip all these these cheap walls. There are people living in every room. Mm-hmm. They had used uh, like hot plates to cook and it was grease stains and, and yeah. garbage thrown down the vents. It was amazing. It was just, it was a total ruin. So uh, it's not. guess anymore. you really like the place, huh? Well, you know, it, <laughs> if you've seen it, it's pretty unique. I mean, yeah. it, you yeah. know, it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's considered the, the architect who did it is a guy who uh, worked on uh, Vassar and he also designed that big uh, church right across from the Poughkeepsie Grand. He did that the year before okay. he did our house. So our house is considered his uh, best personal home that he ever designed. Oh, wow. So it was kind of oh, like, yeah, incumbent on us to, to save it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, But we did kind of a fantasy restoration. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. the, the house is black, but it has two purples, two reds, and copper as an accent on it. So it really stands out when people go by. Yeah. And we added the good creepy fence with all the sharp fleur de lis so that, you know, you, you can file them like Gomez does. <laughs> and, uh, you know, nice, uh, a lot of briars and sharp things yeah. around the edge. Everybody I've spoken to and you know saying you guys were going to come on they're like they're at a big I'm like yeah the big, the big black house on main street and they're <laughs> like that that's <laughs> them I'm like, yeah I'm like, oh, well, who, who did they think <laughs> well, I don't know they, they were just yeah. like oh we pass I mean, by that fits. all the time we just think it's a scary house <laughs> <laughs> and now it's scarier yeah. <laughs> where, where do you get inside <laughs> oh yeah cuz we it, we should do a tour or something sometime and check I'm it lo- out yeah. Yeah, i don't know how you are with tours <laughs> well you know we do th- from we the do, uninitiated we do halloween and mm-hmm. uh, people come by and uh, we have cocktail parties and such yeah. uh, my wife is a cocktailian she's known for that <laughs> so uh, you know, that's we always have good things to drink. Yeah, yeah. Halloween's our, my wife and I's. Um, that's our Halloween. We actually got married on Halloween. We did too. Oh, all right. Mm-hmm. In so 1981, we go. started the tradition, so you <laughs> followed it. Good. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't the conversation like, well, that's in two years, so I guess we better get on that. Like, if we want to get married on a Saturday, otherwise you had to wait like seven yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, every Halloween we, um, our garage, we open up the garage, we decorate the inside, and make the kids come inside to get their candy. And scare and, them. Yeah, and scare the <coughs> ever-loving shit out of them. It's <laughs> little brats. Yeah, yeah, it's the most fun. We, and we get a lot of kids around here, too, so it's, yeah. it's well, just they, our they, holiday. They come for us, too. You know, with, with Joe's house just a little down the block, and he puts out all kinds of animatronics and mm-hmm. fog machines and all of that. Oh, God. Uh, so, so, that and then he, there's always a bunch of costumed or make people around. Some of them even pretend to be animatronics, mm-hmm. and when the kids go past them, they're not, <laughs> <laughs> which really gets them. Uh, but we we get you know we have to get a ton of candy to give out because people come mm. they drive yeah. to come to our houses like suddenly you know vans are showing up and letting all these people out to just mm-hmm. trick or treat oh, and that's you great, know, because though. you know we we've now owned the house just as of a couple of days ago for eight years mm-hmm. so that's how long you know we've had this presence in Poughkeepsie oh man so, so 
That's my direct competition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, the, uh, every, a lot of people that I've spoken to um, about having you guys on, I was like, oh, Church of Satan's coming in. And they were like, what? <laughs> and I had to kind of explain that it's not like devil worship. I know you're probably yeah. exhausted from talking about yeah. this. You know, I've I listened to a bunch of your interviews and everything like that, but I mean, still there's people out there who have just no idea. Like everybody was just like, Oh, is that safe? I'm like, yeah. what do you mean safe? What are you, well, what are you and, talking and, about? And that's debatable depending <laughs> yeah. on who the person is that you're talking right. about. Right. Um, but yeah. um like I con every person I spoke to, I'd have to clear the air and they just look at me with this cockeyed stare, like, eh, I don't know, I'll have yeah. to I'll have to research that myself, <laughs> but they won't. Yeah, of course. No. Well, well yeah. we call that the fear of the S word. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. once you throw that word out there, everyone mm -hmm. freaks out. Because they are uninitiated, they really don't know the philosophy, and they've never read the Satanic Bible right. or any other of the canon of the church. So we're the most fun church there is. We have naked girl altars and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, it's more, more than safe. It's a lot of fun. We went through uh, on the show uh, some of the tenants and stuff, and we are just running them down. I was just like, I can get on board with this. I didn't know, you know. Yeah, I'm still the, new to the whole. We, we uh, that was that was during the our, our Christmas show. No, which is, good. It, it wasn't during that. It was episode number eighty. I just, so it wasn't that. No, okay. Canadian pirates. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So we were we were talking because of that news story, and then we came across your website, and that's where we got familiar with with you guys. And I think we started off like reading off the nine satanic statements. Yeah. And what is that I got here? The 11 rules of the earth. And 11, yeah, things. 11 satanic rules of the earth. And every one of them, it's like, well, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> I think, I'm, I, think I want to be a Satanist. <laughs> you know, that's, that's right. what we're, we're the yeah. most sane religion there is. Yeah, yeah and, and Satanism is really based on human nature. Mm -hmm. What Anton LaVey did is, is said, all these religions are based on denying human nature. So we yeah. really need to have one that affirms what we are. And humans are animals, but mm -hmm. they're animals that can be rational. But we can't get rid of the animal part, and we have mm. to accept that and celebrate it, not just try to repress it and destroy it or feel guilty. Yeah. And he said that there's a demon in man that should be exercised, not exorcised. <laughs> mm. And that was the whole point, is to kind of deal with our natures for real. And, uh, you know, it was one of the first religions to be out there and say they accept all forms of sexuality as long as it's between consenting adults. Everything's cool. Like yeah. nobody had really done that before. Mm -hmm. And when you think that the Satanism was created by a guy who was born in 1930, you know, somebody from that era, yeah. that he'd have that kind of free thinking attitude. Oh was, yeah, it was groundbreaking. And not wound up like in prison. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Like to to be uh, to be a Satanist during like McCarthyism times and stuff like that. Like how how tough that must have been. Well, it, it yeah. was also propitious timing in yeah. 1966. You know, everything mm -hmm. it was freewheeling. You know, it, people embraced the the rebellion of, mm -hmm. of the society at that time. So yeah. it, it was real good timing too, and that's magical. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see your numbers still growing, or oh, hell is yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, it's never stopped growing. Yeah. I mean, people join and leave because they they don't really understand what it is. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're thinking. Well, I don't know what they're thinking, some of them, yeah. because they don't tell us. They, mm -hmm. they, they will join up, and then, you know, a month or a year or five years later, then they send us in a resignation saying, oh, well, it wasn't for me. And we're like, yeah. we never really heard from you, so we don't know <laughs> how you applied this philosophy or not. But the thing is, Satanism is challenging, because what it tells each person is to be the best whoever they are they can be. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a lot of people can't live up to, uh, because you, have to, you can't blame God or the devil. Yeah. Or your six, you know, you can't thank God for successes and blame the devil for failures or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Like it's all in your head. So if you fuck up, you fucked up, and you have to take that and deal with it and make your life better. And having a, a philosophy and a religion that basically says it's all your fault. Mm -hmm. But then if you succeed, then it's like, yeah. Yeah, yay, yeah, yeah. pats on the back, celebrate you, kudos. Mm -hmm. it, it's really kind of this wonderful range, but it really expects people to be fully, yeah you know, cognizant of what their abilities are and to find their weaknesses and fix them and to find those strengths and, and promote them. Right. And, and so there is there is no devil that we worship. There's mm -hmm. no anthropomorphic That, that was going to be, and I, I knew the answer to no, the question, they, they, but I, for the we're, audience, we're I was atheists. going to ask. We're, yeah. we're, we're you know, yeah. basically atheists. So there is, there is no god-like mm -hmm. or demon-like devil that yeah. that's worship that's hogwash mm -hmm. right and yeah if anybody believes that's that, the it's sensationalized it's kind of you know it's ridiculous emo it's just, teenager version of it's, satanism it's the sim it's a <laughs> symbol 
of what we do and mm-hmm. uh, of being a carnal religion. You can't yep. get more carnal right. than Satan. And Satan specifically represents pride and liberty and individualism for us. Because if you look back at Milton and other writers, Byron and the Romantics, they saw Satan as a, as a rebel and somebody who was self-actualized and somebody who wasn't going to submit to tyranny. Mm-hmm. So for us, and in Hebrew, Satan specifically means adversary. Mm-hmm. So we are the adversaries to tyranny and oppression and anybody who would try to keep us from being what we are. And, and that's why it's, it's, you've got to be somebody with some balls to be a Satanist. Mm-hmm. Because you, you are going to stand out, you're going to step out, you're not going to follow the herd. Whatever that herd is, there's always going to be people around you who are going to try to push you into something. The climates change. You know, when I grew mm-hmm. up in the you know, 60s and 70s, uh, coming to consciousness, there was certain kind of things going in the air and what people were fighting in politics. And today we're in this insanely politically correct thing that uh, where you can't really say anything. And, well, and then you also unless have... You, unless you work in the White House, then you can well, say people are sucking their own dicks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's where we're at now. Breaking well, that's it. News. Yeah. We have like populist fascism yeah. that can be filthy and uncivilized. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we have other people who are going to colleges who mm-hmm. are so afraid of being triggered yeah. that you, you can't say anything. Like, that nobody's learning. Yeah. yeah, they are snowflakes. And it's very sad that we're at a point where people can't be challenged. They mm-hmm. refuse to be challenged. If yeah. you challenge them, they want to, like, They're insulted. they want to beat yeah. you up yeah. or set you on fire. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, well, what are these people doing to you? They have ideas. And what do you want to bring against them? Violence. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. Where did that happen before? Yeah. No. I think there are people wearing a funny little thing with yeah. like crosses and they burn books and yeah. put people in gas chambers. It's like, remember that, folks? There's no middle ground anymore. Yeah. 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 Pol- it's, politics has gone crazy. It's strange how far it swung that way, too. Because and how quickly. Yeah. 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 We, we're all aware of it. We all yeah. read the books, you know. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, it's just, ha- it's just happening. It's just happening and letting letting it happen. I don't, you know, and this accountability for yourself and not others kind of like folds into that. Like, oh yeah, you know, if you're accountable for yourself and you're not worried about, you know, well, if that person's saying that, then that's not, you know, that's, you know, as long as it's not affecting me directly or, right, right. you know, not causing me pain, then that's that's. You know, that's yeah. it. Well, but leave these, it at the door. The pain idea is, I think, where people are such babies these days. Because if you're, they're offended in any way, they act like they're mortally wounded. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and if we live in a real world where we're dealing with, like, real opposers, like people who would like to put the full-fledged Sharia law on you, mm-hmm. you know, with, with, or just, you know, chop your head off, yeah. you know, they don't care about ideas. Mm-hmm. It's like if their ideas make you cry, well, they applaud. Because they're here to cut your head off, yeah. Yeah. you know. And if you're whining about that shit, like, what mm-hmm. are you going to do when somebody comes with a machete? Yeah, you know, people are not prepared for any kind of adversarial situation in the real world. Because Darwin was right, mm-hmm. we do compete. It's going to be the survival of the fittest, and we're we're really developing people who aren't fit at all. Well, that's, that's why good, I think you should always good. let your kids play Call of Duty because they're going to hear like the <laughs> worst <laughs> shit. That's a re- that's a real good point, Peter. Because both sides now are looking for their group. Mm-hmm. They can't stand on their own two feet. So it's either they got to be on their yeah. right and be in their group, or they got to mm-hmm. be in the left and be in yeah, their group. So no one's in the middle saying, well, fuck that. I have my own ideas. You know, I was just reading mm-hmm. an article about Bill Maher and uh, an Esquire, man, and he really does take that central stance. You know, he mm-hmm. calls Trump a whiny bitch, but yet. You know, he'll call out some left wingers as big yeah. baby he called, assholes. He called out Obama plenty of times of on course, his show yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. for some bullshit. And so and, the, the, those you know. are the kind of models we really need to look to. And many Satanists, probably all who are card carrying, are very much like that. Independent. We stand on our own two feet. Well, we yeah. also call it finding a third side because we find that most of the time society is presenting an either or alternative. Yeah. We look at that and say, that's all bullshit. Mm-hmm. You you have to make a new synthesis out of things based on what you understand to be true and what works for you. Because again, in Satanism, I call it something that is atheism. Yeah. That instead of you know you're an atheist, yes, there is no mm-hmm. God. But then who's the God? You're your God mm-hmm. because you're the most important thing in the universe to yourself. You create your own hierarchy of values, and therefore, 
that self-centeredness is a positive. It's not something to, to be shunned or rejected. You're not living for other people. Once you're your own God, then you can be a benevolent God and be as nice to whoever you want to. That's your choice. But you have a central point to make all of your values on. You're not a slave to anybody. And that kind of independence is something that's very difficult to, to attain and maintain in today's society. And that's mm. where it's differ- uh, you differentiate yourself from s- atheist. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, it, atheism is a, is a broad term. It just means that there's no God. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give you any then kind of equation about the human species. Right. Because there are atheists who are like socialists and social mm-hmm. justice warriors and all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And Satanism has a really down-to-earth, carnal, skeptical, materialist, pragmatic point of view. All of those values are in play with us. And that we look at the human animal and we deal with it realistically. We don't sugarcoat we don't, we're not idealistic at all. We just look at what's the reality, what people are, and try to live with that and work with it. And it's, you know, warts and all. Uh, that's why one of the early things that Anton LaVey used to talk about is that we accept human emotions from love to hate, the whole gamut. Mm. And the thing is, love is very rarefied. Do you really love everybody? Do you really get that kind of crazy passion for everybody? No, it's kind of rare. Mm. Same thing with hate. Do you really get that kind of passionate hatred for everybody? Yeah. Not likely. So those are your two compass points. Everything else is somewhere in between. But they're all natural. If somebody does something bad to you, does some real injustice, harms you or the people that you love or care for, or the things or principles that you love or care for, then you can hate them or be furious. There's nothing wrong with that. You, know, you don't have to ask for forgiveness for that. You embrace it and work through it. Yeah. It's like the guy who stiffed me on my fence. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to mention companies? <laughs> uh, he folded up his company, too. So yeah. you know oh, there you go. Yeah, it's the basis of psychotherapy. You know, just yeah. let out your anger. Deal yeah. with it. Yeah. Fight it off. But not to, not to you know, beat yourself up over it, because right. there's been always too much of that. And again, in the politically correct thing, like, you shouldn't feel like that, and you shouldn't hate, and you, you have to love everybody, which is, again, we always find that Christianity was always presenting that to you. Love everybody. Love your neighbor. And it was like, bullshit. Mm. Uh, People have to earn your love, and very few people will in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. And those people you will respect and you will cherish, and there will be passion. And you, there should be passion. That's something that's important. It's kind of how I've been following. <laughs> that's like just been my compass, uh, not knowing the but, church or anything like that. Well, you'd Satan. be surprised how many people say that. You know, They, they, they say, mm-hmm. well, I read the Satanic Bible, and it resonated with me. And that's mm-hmm. what I've been thinking all along. How many times have we heard that? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Millions of well, what's fun is that, you know, often when we do things with media people, because like, media people have to have an open mind unless it's a Christian media or something, yeah, yeah. or it's Al Jazeera or something or whatever, you know, you're, you're, you've got some kind of specific agendas you're trying to put out. I don't know that Al Jazeera necessarily does that. They're out of Qatar, aren't they? They're getting in all kinds yeah. of trouble <laughs> uh, <laughs> these days. But, but any kind of specific media that is investigative has to have some kind of, of openness to what they're looking at. And usually the people in them, they may have their own specific you know, religion and philosophy, but they, they understand how to suspend that to a certain point mm-hmm. so they can look into these other things and explore them and, and question them with open minds. So Satanism is all about having an open mind and always questioning because the skepticism is really an important thing. We do not have any faith in Satanism. There is nothing spiritual. We are completely carnal. We think mm-hmm. the spiritual is a complete falsehood. It's fiction. So people often find that's really tough to deal with because they want to mm-hmm. comfort themselves with certain things. Like, yeah. oh, there, there must be a heaven. There must be somebody to forgive me. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to make it all better, or there's going to be a reboot at some point. And what we say is there isn't. Every minute yeah. you waste is a minute gone, and everything you don't fix in your life will stay broken, and it's on you. Yeah. And that is tough, which is why yeah. there aren't a lot of people who actually will make a commitment to Satanism, because that's the point. We don't give these hugs and buffers mm-hmm. and easy ways out, because we don't think life has an easy way out. Mm-mm. <laughs> no, the way out is not good, yeah. and it's like, yeah. over, yeah. you're done. So well, that actually you know, brings up a question. Death, what yeah. do you believe happens? That's it. Done. Yeah. Party's Just over. Blackness? Yeah. Yep. Like yep. the, what is so it, the Lutherans? <laughs> they believe that too? <laughs> um, I would say that's the only thing similar to the Lutherans in this <laughs> whole comparison. So yeah, just nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, and no, I, no. I, I, I heard in an interview you said you don't fear death. No. Well, why should you? You wouldn't even be conscious yeah, of you're it. Not gonna know, you're not going to know the difference. Nope. <laughs> no, there's nothing to fear. I mean, it's it's done. You're, you're asleep forever. Done. 
They enjoy mm-hmm. life now. That's the key. I've always said that to people. They've asked. Um, um, I used to work with a um, born again type Christian guy, and him and I used to get into discussions all the time. It was like talking to a brick wall m- mm. from most times. Isn't that just maddening? But <laughs> he asked me. He goes, "Oh, let me ask you this question." Like he was going to get me. <laughs> uh, are you afraid to die? And I was like, "No." It's like if you died right now, I'm like, "If I died right now, well, well what happened?" You, you know, know, I mean, like I'm married. I'm married I married the girl of, the, of my dreams. Good. Say, the girl of my dreams. Just well, the girl that was good. able to tolerate me enough who I love, you know. Good thing you said that. Uh, <laughs> Although that, you dreamed of having a girl who would tolerate you, so there yeah, you go. That's more of, you know, <laughs> you just know, want someone who can understand and tolerate me. And, you know, I had, you know, dogs, house, everything. You know, we got this show. If I died tomorrow, I'm like, well, I did. As, I you did, have a legacy. Uh, right. I have something. Right. <laughs> but... I'm content with what I have. I don't need to be rich. I don't need anything like that. So if I die tomorrow, it's going to be sad. I don't want to leave anybody behind. But, hey, that's the shit that happens. You know the way I always look at it? I wrote a book once um, a few years back called Occult Investigator. And we did some uh, investigations of the paranormal with a a detective agency here in New York. And we did a number of cases. And we didn't find anything conclusive. There is... There was nothing conclu- conclusive, nor did I expect to find anything conclusive as far as paranormal goes. It, and the way I always looked at it is, it, you know, ghost hunters this, ghost that, paranormal that. If there was any real solid evidence, especially today in, in the technological age that we live in, we would have a document. But more importantly, if anybody found anything like that, hmm. they'd make a lot of money out yeah, of it. Yeah, that's I've so always said I'll nobody never, yeah. has done it. No yeah. one has proven it. No one has made yeah. money on it. I've always so said I'll, I'll, I won't bother watching those shows because when they find something, it'll be on the news. Right. Yeah. So exactly. I'll be. I'll see it. That's it'll have right. ten million views on that's YouTube right. in twenty four so, hours. So right. there is no afterlife yeah. to deal with. It, mm. it doesn't happen. You don't mm. think that there's any kind of like. Well, your atoms get scattered into the universe to, again, what but you're not going to. They're not going to reform like you know in Star Trek and and and, and a simulator or something and become a, another person. It's not going to happen. Hmm. Well, that's why again you never should waste any time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> <laughs> it really is every minute wasted is a minute dead. Yeah. And that's that's really something that I don't think most people think about. Well, yeah. you know, the question is, will technology in a thousand years be able to take your consciousness and put it into a machine now, that's debatable <laughs> but yeah. does that yeah, mean you'll live d- forever i don't know if that's you i think that's a new version well, of right you. of course you know what i mean of well, course. It, that was always the concept in the transport in star trek like they dissolved yeah. you but is and did your put, is your consciousness yeah. continuous or is it just a remarkable duplicate of you yeah, that yeah. really isn't you again right. yeah where it's actually like the prestige where he dies every single exactly. night exactly yeah. you know he drowns every night yep. sorry spoiler alert guys sorry it's a 12 year old movie it's a good movie. film good yeah. film <laughs> I love yeah. that film. Yeah. 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 But, but, uh, but yeah, consciousness is something we don't understand. Mm-hmm. And the idea of being able to, to, to emulate it is what we're trying to do with AI these days. Mm-hmm. But we can't, we don't even know what makes us conscious. That's something that's being debated. Well, I know Jack Daniels makes me unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> well, Siri is awful, so we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the imagery is what kind of baffles, uh, not baffles me, but. It's interesting to me, like, um, you know, the pentagrams, Baphomet, um, the n- nude altars and everything like that. What, why that? Well, originally Anton LaVey, who was a showman and he worked in the carnivals mm-hmm. and circuses and stuff when he was younger, said, I need to get attention. Uh, in the 60s, there was an occult revival going on. But occultism was the usual kind of theistic, airy-fairy kind of bullshit. And he said... I bet I could leverage this in a way that's earthy and carnal and not just this kind of spiritualist nonsense. I mean, he had friends who were police detectives and cops and lawyers and, and you know, all kinds of crazy circus people. And, I mean, he, he, he was a lion tamer for a while yeah. and kept a lion as a pet. So, he, you know, he knows about, like, the, the, the world and how people behave. So he thought symbols are powerful. And if you go to, to somebody even like Ayn Rand who influenced him, like sh- she would talk about humans being uh, creatures of conceptual consciousness. It means that we take all the things that we perceive and we link them together in 
percepts and then into concepts and then bigger and bigger concepts. So we have hierarchies. So we can understand everything that comes in through our senses. So a symbol is, is something that allows us to sort of access a lot of things simultaneously. Like I look at your symbol for Dead Radio Podcast and I see the bent antennae, but shaped in the, the sort of uh, biohazard pattern. And you have like the broadcasting, you know, things there. So it's mm. like you've created a powerful symbol there. Mm. But in that, it's... I it's, created it. He yeah, did he, nothing. He did. <laughs> awesome. It's very, it's very powerful. Thank but you. The, but the whole point of a symbol is that it has all these ideas that mm. you can access simultaneously. You don't have to sit down and think about them separately. When you look at an American flag, well, I've got like a... See, you're an somewhere. atheist. Yeah. So, so yeah, the thing is that, that any kind of symbol pulls all these aspects with it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he looked back and said, all right, Satan means adversary. I want to use Satan as, as my main primary symbol because I'm setting up an adversary to all spiritual religions, Western, Eastern, uh, Christian, pagan, everything. He's going to, I'm against it all. And atheism is just a, a first stepping stone. Like I need something more, something more focused. So he found this symbol uh, on the cover of a book he had that was the, the, the pentagram... Uh, where is it over here? Yeah. Or <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know that uh, has on it. You know, around the circle it says Leviathan in Hebrew, and that means the dragon of the watery abyss, mm -hmm. which was the adversary of God in in Hebrew mythology. So he's like, all right, that this is good. Like, there's the goat, and the goat goes back to the to ancient Egypt, and it stands for carnality and the hidden force in nature of of you know f fleshy consciousness. So he pulls all that together and saying, okay, this is it. And it's mm -hmm. going to freak everybody out because nobody used that symbol for Satan before him. It sort of came out of French occultism, and we documented on the website. But it wasn't used in any kind of popular culture sense until he did it. If you watch movies or, or anything before, and we even have an old porno black mass from like the 20s, and there's, there's no Baphomets in there. There's like mm -hmm. six-pointed stars, and there's all kinds of you know, naked nuns. And we'll have to give you a copy. You'll probably enjoy it. <laughs> Sounds uh, great. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, he, he, he really brought that home, that idea, yeah. that image and linked it with Satan, and that became a drama, something that people could look at and be excited by. And then he created the idea of, we all do ritual. We have birthday parties, we have uh, parades, we have all these kind of all ceremonial gestures because they have emotional aspects to them. So he said, all right, I'm going to set up a ritual format so it's a way of, of being spooky and gothic and fun because it's evocative, mm -hmm. but also that it's a format for you to release your emotions. But the whole point, too, of that is even though he gave guidelines, he said, mm, do whatever you want with it because it's all about you. Like, your emotions have to be released. You have to use the symbols and, and words that are going to bring the most out, the music that you like most. Uh, and and you know, Dr. LeVay was somebody who was a real expert in popular music, like old popular music for, from the 20s, 30s, 40s. He knew all of that stuff and could play it. He was a really amazing musician and could just play it out of his head. And he also knew some classical music, too. He was pretty well studied in that as well. Whenever I'd go visit him, he'd, he'd practice that up and play Liszt and Wagner and Beethoven, and I'd sing along with some things. We'd have a lot of fun with that. Uh, and, but, but that was really a way of everybody had to pick their own music because, like, younger Satanists come in, and some of them were the stereotype, like the death and black metal and whatever. But then there are Satanists who like, you know, minimalism and who like... Um, it's like uh, very light popular tunes, but if they have some kind of sentimental value, that's the thing that keys off of them and, and makes their emotions work. So you could use any any music or none at all in your rituals because it's again, it's all about you. Yeah, because that was you know my 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 first response to most things is why or how you know, and that <laughs> it's a great answer to that question is why use a symbol and you can if you want or don't. <laughs> yeah, but also, also people say, all right, we've got Satanism and it's atheist and all of that and people who come to it from atheism are like, so do I have to do all of this stuff? And the answer is no, mm -hmm. because ritual is a tool and you can open up the toolbox of Satanism and say, oh, that's kind of cool. I could get something out of it. Or you could go, eh, I'm not comfortable with that. But what we've always found with people over the years is that the ones who are often the most reluctant to use it it affects them the most. Mm -hmm. Because if they sit down there and they, they get a couple of candles together and a bell and, you know, put a symbol on a wall and then get the kind of meditative focus you need to begin a ritual. Once you ring the bell and say these words, but you take it on yourself, you're not like going to a church and some priest is doing it for you. You're saying it. You're taking command of it. That people get excited. They get that shiver up their spines. And suddenly it's like, oh, now I see what this is about. 
And whether they even ever do it again, it doesn't matter. But they can see that's what the validity is, that it really affects aspects of human consciousness. And, and we see it in different cultures. There are different kinds of rituals, and there's different kinds of meditation and such. And uh, it wouldn't be there if it wasn't part of the human animal. Right, yeah. Uh, I, w- I want to talk about fear, though. Mm-hmm. Fear is another, that's a strong, it's a strong emotion. Uh, we were talking about Halloween before, you know, luring kids into my garage, trying to scare the shit out of them. Luring, I've always been a not fan. a good word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, luring, luring and kids in the same sentence, not a good thing. I, uh, it's I just, only okay on Halloween. That fear that that strikes people, like I've always see, found fear, you know, scary movies, the you know that kind of dark imagery and everything like that, more fascinating than sca- like I like when my pulse races when I'm scared. To an extent, you know. Well, we call that eustress. Off the off the <laughs> cliff, you know, driving off the cliff. That's not. That's yeah. You know, that's well, a that's little what different. Kind roller of fear, coasters give you like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Having that little bit of poke where uh, this could all fall apart real quick, like, is kind of is what I really kind of enjoy, and that's why the imagery and everything like that. I think, to me, that kind of it struck me as. Ooh, I want to. I'm interested in that because it's... Well, you know, to uh, extrapolate that some, it, it, it also becomes... It validates people in, in a way. You know, I, another plug for a book. I, I wrote the Satanic Warlock book, and it's a men's manual. It's the, the it's companion, companion to the to, to satanic, satanic witch. Yeah. And by identifying as a warlock, it gives people a, a badge. It, it tells them who they are, and th- that boosts confidence, you know, because they, they, a lot of people who don't really know who they are or are kind of floundering in their own personality, grab onto that and say, oh, that's what I am. And that subconsciously boosts their confidence. So it's, it, there's another method and the, there's an, an, another benefit to all of the symbolism. Mm-hmm. And also to go back to the fear aspect thing. When you were talking about it, and, and I was watching your face, that every time you talked about something that scared you, it's something that really made you feel more alive, because it sharpened your perception of your existence, because the fear gives you the possibility of non-existence. Because most people kind of take it for granted. I think most people don't even think they're going to die, and when you're young in particular. When you get older and you've had some diseases or accidents or whatever, you know that like that could happen to you. But often when people are young, it's just something that like, ah, yeah, I'm here forever. It's kind of like really assumed. So that the fear part at whatever age you are is the thing that gives you that sense that, uh-oh, there is an edge here and I do have to worry. And it heightens your perceptions and sensibilities that it makes you, it, it's like a, a like salt and pepper or spices to whatever that you're doing. Suddenly everything is much heightened. Right. And that's, that's why everybody likes it. I mean, everybody likes to be scared. <laughs> I'm not even <laughs> just talking death. I'm just talking... Uh stressful you know a strange new situation that you don't have complete control over too like that that the other thing about it was control control over yourself mm-hmm. and um um i know that hedonism is not the word you use but um oh, epicureanism epicureanism that was yeah. the word well cuz hedonism is just un unmitigated it's just we talk about indulgence versus compulsion and right. indulgence is, is your choice. Compulsion means something's driving you. You don't have control over it. When, like, people are addicted to smoking or whatever, it's a compulsion. And for us, it's like, no, it, it has to be a choice. It has to be something you control, something right. that you dip into. It's like, oh, there's that box of chocolates. Which one do I want? You don't have to, you're not forced to eat them all. Pick whichever ones you want. But have that kind of control over your life. And that's an important aspect, not to be compelled to do things, yeah. but to have that Well, because if everybody did whatever they wanted, everyone would be on heroin. You know, everyone. <laughs> you know. Well, I don't, I, I don't think I'd agree with that, but... Uh, <laughs> But you know, well, if, the, if there were no, you know, if if you thought about things like there are no consequences, and you know, you don't have to, you know, you're going to oh, indulge yeah, yeah. to, to whatever degree, right? You know? Right. Well, that's why we we embrace the social contract because we mm. don't live by ourselves. Humans are social creatures. We we have a, you know various tribes. And the tribes keep being organized into bigger tribes. You know, cities, states, nations, the globe. Uh, and all the different varying cultures and who identifies with what. So because of that, we have to then think about uh, how we're fitting in and where we're going to take ourselves. Like, you know, how are you going to guide yourself out of that uh, by understanding your place in the skein of existence? And therefore, you have responsibility. You can't just do anything because it affects people around you. What's funny to me is that I always think about Christians who will always say, well, if there's no God up there to, like, punish you, 
Uh, they don't always say that part of it, but if there's no God up there, like that, that guy I was talking about oh, before, he, he brought he that up. Literally said that. If yeah. there's no God, then why? What's stopping? Yeah. Why you aren't from... you raping me right now? And it's like, well, dude, you're not hot. <laughs> you know, because you'll go to jail. That's one yeah. answer. Yeah. <laughs> but but that's the thing. But but it's also I think they really think that everybody is scared into behaving and that it isn't a personal choice. Like we think that, you know, all the people that I know and deal with are people that doesn't matter if there are no laws they treat each other equitably because they yeah. choose to and that you can do that that we're we're not you know even though we're animals we're not out of control we're rational animals yeah but those people who need that kind of you know whip put over yeah. them i worry they're about they're them they're the ones that are, have the problem yeah, yeah. i've always seen that as a weakness to me mm. i just oh, absolutely. E- needing something to get you over that hump um like um ad- uh, i wanted to talk a little bit about addiction because um I've, you know, I've people that I know that have addiction issues and, um, yeah. Oh yeah. My, <laughs> my co-host, for instance, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, the, uh, the addiction part with, the um, using, um, some AA or whatever, not AA, but some recovery programs. Yeah. Well, they're secular a, ones. They're definitely yeah. are secular yeah. ones. And that's why we, we also direct a lot of people to atheist organizations because they have set up things like that. Yeah. And, uh, it, it was hard. It's not, um, it's pretty rare. At least well, it used to be. Yeah. Better. I'm sure there's more now. If you look online, but, you'd be surprised that, yeah. that okay. you know, they may not be everywhere. Like, cause every church is pulling that kind of nonsense because yeah, they want to suck you into God. Yeah. Did they hear? Did you, you? We talked about the guy who went back. He went to jail. He was in jail. He had multiple DWIs and spent, you know, six months in, in prison because of it. And when he got out, it was mandated that he join Alcoholics Anonymous specifically, and he couldn't complete the program because he refused to accept God. Right, right. And they sent him back to jail. Wow, that's yeah, yeah. That's something that you'd have to get the ACLU involved yeah. because that's just nonsense. Yeah, and it, it is it is growing. You know that there are options and that they're accredited mm-hmm. and actually, I think in many cases are probably doing better yeah. than those things because well, because you're just trading one addiction for another. Exactly. Well, that was yeah. the old Cheech and Chong line. Yeah. You know, you, you used to be all fucked up on drugs, now I'm all fucked up on the Lord. Yeah. Really, is that a great alternative? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's certainly less destructive, I guess, for your. Per, for you personally, for some people, but you know, it's still you're still trading one problem for another. You know, that's well, like yeah, and it is that's like problem. chewing nicotine gum for the rest of your life. It doesn't make any sense. You know, also the idea that if you get into that kind of heavy duty religion, mm-hmm. that you're going to start forcing things on other people yeah. and making their lives miserable. So that yeah, you might have been making their lives miserable one way beforehand, but yeah. now you're doing it in a different way. Yeah. Um, have you seen addiction issues in the within not? You within the church? Yeah. Oh, definitely. There are people come to us and we've had those problems, and they find that when they really start to take command of themselves, they look back and they use Satanism as a strong point to to fight the addiction because they yeah. say no one else is going to do this for me, and there's certainly no God to help me on this. And I look to my friends and my family and people that I can trust to help me gain a kind of measure of myself again and move forward. I mean, we definitely, we, you know, we've talked to people over the years and, and seen them like the people have fought through that, and it's, it's brave and wonderful, and they do. They don't need God. They don't need some kind of a rote program to reprogram themselves. That They, they can work to, to do it. It's not easy. I have definitely seen people do some really struggles to get through that kind of thing, but uh, but it's, it's, it's heroic when they do, and it's very uh, heartening. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I can definitely see the personal responsibility having, because uh, I mean, I left religion when I was very young because I never, I never believed it. I was going through the motions, and then I finally was like, I'm not doing this anymore, guys. To you know, my family who weren't religious at all, they just didn't want their parents to yell at them for not sending me to church, and uh, that always seemed insane to me. We have to go to church because your grandmother's in town. Why? <laughs> Why are we doing that? But it was just I give felt granny like, some yeah, gin and stay yeah. home. I just felt like if people in like people that were very religious were wasting a lot of time asking a figment of their imagination to help them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's that's like buying lottery tickets. It doesn't make any sense. 
Should have yeah. had you guys in for our Moss Spectacular. Yeah. We every yeah. every year on the solstice we do a um a a, a Moss Spectacular yeah. and it's keeping Christ out of Christmas. Oh yeah. Well that's that's <laughs> something I always say. <laughs> yeah. And, and we like, just like yeah. we huddle around say with no our to the Nazarene. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the you know, opiate of the masses. That's yeah. what yep. it is. Yeah. Absolutely. The best way it I mean everybody it. likes presents, but let's let's keep <laughs> let's keep Jesus out. It's gotten to the point where I'm like, I come come uh, you know, December. After Thanksgiving, I'm done. I've, mm-hmm. I'm, I just want to check out for the next three months. I don't even mm-hmm. care. It's just the commercialization of it all and just the hypocrisy of everything. It just it it's taken me just completely out of any kind of um, positive, you know, vibes. We you don't. Know, you, you have to well, you pull need, out of you're, what you you're want. brave. You know, you need to be brave to make that decision. Oh, like, you know, for Christmas, you know, everybody's, you know, going to this person, that person's, you know, doing the whole thing. My wife and I, we just go out and get sushi. Like, we don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. We just go out and we see a movie, we go, see su- we go get sushi, and we go home. And then that's that's our day. And everybody thinks that we're nuts. But meanwhile... No, that sounds good. <laughs> What's wrong know? with that? Yeah, I... Uh, a lot of things. <laughs> Getting <laughs> married on Halloween was a thing. Yeah. You know, it just... Well, you know... <laughs> Our ha- when we got married on Halloween, uh, you know, 36 years ago, um, nobody did that. And we no, did a Halloween yeah. party, and we had a mm-hmm. Justice of the Peace, because you know, there was nobody else around who would do that for it and, f- and formalize yeah. it for us. He got married by a, a gay man in a costume. Yeah. Awesome. He was yeah. dressed up as his headless horseman, <laughs> and, you know, he, had, he, he took $50 of his own money and became a minister. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and well, that was that. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, who lives down the block from me, Joe Netherworld, he did the first legal same-sex marriage in New York. Oh. Right at cool. his house. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, and signed it as a, you know... Priest in the Church of Satan. Oh, fantastic! It was it was the very first thing that had been done in New York. My wife that. just um, married my uh, her sister and her girlfriend down yeah. in Florida. She's a minister. Awesome, <laughs> yeah. awesome. I would so. just so love to have you know a minister from the Church of Satan do my wedding just to make my family super mad. <laughs> <laughs> just my dad it would be like, be, "That's it hilarious." Could be done, <laughs> you know, because you know he'll show off with like a cut off T shirt and his goatee on a Harley and. You know, then my my grandparents from out of state and stuff would come in and be like, "This is ridiculous." Yeah. Well, I did yeah. a biker funeral in the city yeah. years ago. One of our members, um, he was part of a motorcycle club, and he passed away. And uh, he, it was a sort of non denominational chapel uh, in the city, but they had his his uh, you know bike outside, beautifully polished and set up you know, the riderless horse thing, and then he painted, and they had his artwork inside, and they also had. Um, he was in his casket, but in like King Diamond makeup because he liked that. <laughs> and he had, you know, all of his jewelry and they had his shirt open so he could see his tattoos. And it was pretty remarkable. And, and the, the place was totally cool with it. And I officiated at that. And, and, and all the people who showed up were very emotional. It was fantastic. And they understood that, you know, this is what he cherished and these what were these are what his values were. Mm. And they, they stood up for them and it was fantastic. You know, it, it can be done, these kind of mm-hmm. alternative things. Uh, you know, certainly weddings like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, our priesthood marries people all over the place. And, uh, you know, that's that's a thing that can be done. And, you know, again, funerals uh, happen and uh, we have baptisms, but they're not really necessary because what happens is we don't do them to kids who are young or babies or whatever because they don't have any choice in it. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, if if you have a kid and they reach a certain point where they understand Satanism and they want an initiation of some sorts, the parents can do that with their, their kid. Because, but it has to be completely willing and understood. Mm-hmm. And uh, for adults who come in, we have a baptism right too. But you know, most people don't really feel because what we say is Satanists are born, not made. Mm-hmm. And if you just recognize that that's your nature, and you read the literature and go, oh, yeah, that, I agree with all this. It's like right there you are. You always were there. Mm-hmm. So you don't even need that unless you really like that kind of initiatory ritual. And then that's something that's done. But we find that these days, it's not something that most people feel they need because they're like, you know, I always felt this way. Yeah. And now I'm recognizing it. It's just like bingo. I don't. I don't. I don't even need to do something to mark this. When the Church of Satan started, I think more people did because they would be admired in other religions, mm-hmm. and for them it was a way of saying I'm breaking free of this and really making a different commitment to this philosophy that puts me at the center of my life. But nowadays, eh, it's not so difficult for people. Yeah, I, I think I feel like the majority of people, at least younger people, are just totally fine with moving towards a more secular society, not having that influence. I I mean, I don't really know anybody my age that really is very religious and goes to church and actually subscribes to things. 
you know, a couple people, yeah, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic, but I haven't been to church in six years. So you're not really. Well, right? you know I mean? it's very <laughs> geographic now, yeah, too. Yeah. You know, you go up into the Midwest, mm-hmm. up north, Midwest, you're going to mm-hmm. find a whole different yeah. idea going yeah. on. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it is, uh, I do notice it more in more liberal areas, and where we live is extremely liberal. Um, I'm not going to say... I guess I could. Um, better educated people tend to not be as religious. <laughs> oh, I think they've actually done surveys that yeah. really do show that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I've also seen things in my life where you know, you know, you, you know, somebody with an accent that you can't understand at all. They're from a very poor area. You know, they're not they're not as well educated. And I think that that a lot of those things come down to it. And when people are well educated. And in you know a safe place where they can grow as a person, they might not need to latch onto those things. They're not wishing for things as much. I better you know? get me some education. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I think it comes down to back to that thing where you just you're spending a lot of time asking a, a figment of your imagination for things. You know, maybe if you aren't want for things like healthcare. You might not have to do that. <laughs> yeah, you know. But what we found too, though, it's it's kind of interesting that there'll be people who might be brought up with religious people around them, and they'll always feel they're out of step with it. Yeah, and they might not have a great education. They might not mm-hmm. be exposed to a lot, but they just know from the start that they are not mm-hmm. part of what's going on around them. Yeah, and that's why I always say that Satanists are a meta tribe. Are kind of people who are born that way are are not the most common people on the planet, but when they happen. They, mm-hmm. they see that they are not part of, of mm-hmm. everyone else, what we call the herd. Yeah. And what we define Satanists as, we call ourselves an alien elite, because we're alien because we're alienated from most of the herd culture around us. And we're elite because we're the ones willing to step up and say, no, mm-hmm. I'm not part of that. It, it, you know, have that bravery to say, I'm going to take a different route. And, and they really come from all over the earth and all these different mm-hmm. cultures. It's, it's kind of amazing that, especially, you know, I've been running this organization since 2001, and finding that uh, as, you know, my book's been translated, translated into seven different languages, <clears throat> and the Satanic Bible's been into about 12, I think, mm-hmm. and people just come from all over the place, and they read these things and go, ah, that's been me all along, and I never knew how to label myself. And I know that I can be part of this. There are other people like me. It doesn't matter that they're in other countries. They might not be close. I mean, we get people from the Middle East who you know, have been like raised in believing Allah and doing all this crap, but they didn't. And they had to be kind of quiet about it because they might not survive. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't, I, grew up, I grew up Catholic. I had a, I had a little, little Bible next to my bed, and I had the rosaries and the whole nine yards. I used to go to church, but we never went to church. Went to church with my grandmother when I went to visit her and everything. But every time I went, I just kind of was just like, you know, this doesn't, this, this yeah. doesn't feel right. It's not, it doesn't make sense. And I couldn't, f- but I still followed it because I didn't want my. Yeah, that's what you do. You don't want to get yelled at. Yeah, I didn't want to yeah. get yelled at. I wanted to make sure that, you know. I didn't know the devil and all this nonsense, but finally, just, I don't. I don't even know when it was. It was just slowly, finally, just decided that I just didn't want to pay attention anymore. And finally, one day, I just said, "Fuck this! I'm just gonna yeah. do. I'm just gonna do me." I'm gonna because you aren't afraid anymore. Yeah, it's all fear based. Yeah, yeah, and, that's and the thing. for me, I went. I went years saying that I was agnostic, which I think is kind of. I now feel like that was just me. It's a half measure. You're you know? preparing the way. Yeah, and then uh, one day I was like, you know what? No, I'm a- like, and I've always said I'm not anti-theist. I'm not going to judge you for your choices, at least not out loud. But you know, it's I, you do whatever you want. Just don't push it on me. That was the whole thing. So if you want to be religious, that's fine. But if you're going to come at me with all those things, I'm going to come at you with facts, and then it's going to be a slightly different conversation than you were hoping to get out of it. Right. See, you're yeah. you're really following the same path that so many yeah. of our people do. Yeah. It's exactly that thing. That they they really you know, the, the agnosticism thing. We still get people who approach us on, "Well, can I be an agnostic and be a satanist?" And I'm always like, "Why are you an agnostic? Yeah. Have you not really examined this question? Because satanism is a faithless religion." Yeah. And that agnosticism means that you have a faith that there could be something like yeah. that. But they don't even want to take it to the aspect of, 
Well, you know, it could be like an elephant on a platform, you know, with mm-hmm. angels dancing around. How like, fucking cool! Like, yeah. you know, or or you know, <laughs> I'd pay you know, Marilyn Monroe, that. like yeah. you know, the, the universe is on her bosom or something. Yeah. Like, and that's not real. Yeah. Damn. Well, <laughs> uh, don't yeah, tell. Yeah, I mean, uh, like for me, uh, the only thing that, like, I do, I do wish there was an afterlife, but I feel like that's not very likely. And the, there's tiny little bits of scientific evidence that show there might be a little something. But I kind of highly doubt you're going to be a sentient human somewhere else, right? Right. Um, but that you know, that's just that's more of like that'd be nice. I don't really think it's true, though. You know, same guy. Um, I'm going to keep going back to this guy because I, you can say his name. That's fine. And his name was Drew. Uh, <laughs> we used to uh, my old job. I used to be on the road a lot, two hour travel here and there, and it'd just be him and I sitting there talking. And, you know, religion would always come up. He said to me one time that if the whole world followed uh, Christianity, a Christian belief, then we'd all be better off. Yeah, because they would have, like, yeah, because they'd, they'd kill off 70% of the population. Well, no, no, no like not even that. If, everybody's, yeah. if everybody has the same mentality, then, yeah, of course, it makes sense. But if everybody was fucking uh, were pagan, same thing. If well, everybody was Satanist, same I, thing. It just... The argument... I, it's I've heard all my life is, you know, there's, there are no atheists in the foxhole. So that's where you start to get into real serious debate with people. You know, mm-hmm. when people are faced with death, mm-hmm. face to face, when you know in a minute you could be gone, you're having a heart attack, you could be gone, that's when you really know. That, the, then again, that's a function of your bravery. I mean, that's a function of you having conditioned your mind to an extent over your life to understand I have to live life to the fullest, and if this is it, I did my best. And there are many Satanists in the military. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we there's plenty of Satanists in the foxhole, and they're usually very well trained and have no compunctions about killing the enemy. So <laughs> they're good to have at your side. Um, can we talk about old Nick a oh, little bit? Oh, we can talk about old Nick as much as you would like. <laughs> Am I balling this? Are we having this? conversation about the church but you're here with the uh yeah. with the magazine yeah <laughs> um reading here I, I bring the girls to the party <laughs> <laughs> smoking and drinking advice add vice a cigar and port wine primer yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what caught my eye i was like oh, yeah, no, again you know it's, the, it's indulgence <laughs> it's epicurean delight and this is what we we live for L- i'll give you a little history about how Please. old nick started um in 2006, we had quite an event in Los Angeles, at 6606, mm-hmm. and it was a major uh, event for the Church of Satan. And in preparation for that, I've my background is, is in journalism and magazine production. I worked for High Society and Cherie Magazine and Playboy, so I've, I've got a, a long history on that. So at the time, I was actually working for Playboy, and I said, well, you know what I, I've always wanted to do is to create something that appeals to both of my most important things in life. And that was the magazine business and the Church of Satan. So I said, well, the magazine business, of course, that I'm involved with now has, is about porn. So <laughs> let me create a Playboy with horns. And that's what I did. It was, it was really done as a lark I, for, the, for the membership that came to L.A. And we had quite a, a number of people there. So I put this magazine together, and I said, "Now, you know, I'll I'll borrow some some Playboy ideas here, and some, and make it the only magazine that is decidedly of interest to those with a dark bent." Um, and Satanism is a part of it. It's not wasn't endorsed by the Church of Satan, but it certainly was influenced. So that's how I created Old Nick, and Old Nick uh, is a euphemism for Satan, yeah. the devil. Um, the response was overwhelming. People just said, wow, this is so cool. No one has ever done this. There's no other magazine like this. And it, the rest is history. It, I created another issue and another. And we have uh, just celebrated 10 years of publishing uh, last year. <laughs> This is the the tenth year yeah. anniversary issue, and this is the f- and this is the that's first? the first one. You'll see it's a little different because I didn't think there'd be a second issue, just like Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the, it was the same idea, um, and y- you know, 
all of the things that appeal to men, and, and it is a men's magazine. Uh, women, some women enjoy it, but it is a men's magazine, and it is it does touch upon all the things that make life worth living. You know, it is the, the cigar smoking and a good drink and having a good time and travel and all of that that good life stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I peppered it with satanic wisdom, satanic philosophy, satanic thought. Because that's what it is. We are the most carnal religion in the world, so it fit perfectly. It it, it was just a propitious combination of things that at the, at that moment at six 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 oh six, and it just gelled. It was another one of those magical moments in in our history of the Church of Satan. Uh, it was wild. I I haven't. You know, as the first time I've heard of it was, you know, <laughs> when you guys were coming on, I haven't had a chance to really rifle through them. <laughs> well, sure. But now we have them, so. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, was, he was a little worried uh, <laughs> about you guys coming on because um, I, like, put, you know, I, I basically copied and pasted your bios off of your, your, you know, various sources. And he's like, I was a little nervous. And then when I told him, I was like, yeah, it's like it's like a high, high-end Satanist kind of, you know, it's kind of a porn magazine, but not like, you know, it's more sensual. And he was like, oh, that makes me feel better. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, he was worried that it was going to be super serious. We were going to be like way out of our element and all of that. You know, yeah. Interestingly enough, over the years, it, it has grown mm-hmm. out of the realm of people who are even interested in Satanism. I mean, mm-hmm. I, it, oh God, I could probably probably safely say thousands of readers who really are just kind of on the edge of Satanism or are curious about it because, of you know, we subscribe to something called the law of the forbidden. And when something is forbidden, it's that much mm-hmm. more alluring. And there are a lot of people out there, and I get this response from them, that, oh, yeah, you know, those girls, maybe they're, they're altar girls. And some of them are. You know, some of the, these, the girls who have appeared in the magazine have not appeared anywhere else. They're newbies to the whole business, but they are Satanists, and they enjoy our, our philosophy and our religion. So we use that. Um, and I, I, I hear this all the time, you know, this, this magazine really is something different. And, you know, I could read an article about, you know, uh, uh, fashion and how, you know, we sub- Satanists subscribe to the idea that we can live on our, our own time frame in our own era, you know, and whichever, whatever era resonates with us. If we want to be hippies, you could be hippies. If you want to be a 20s gangster, you could be a 20s gangster. Whatever that time frame resonates with, with a person, you could live that, and we, we propagate that. You know, I particularly like the whole Rat Pack era. You know, that's, uh, that fits perfectly with me because <laughs> I'm an old fuck. But that's, <laughs> that's beside the point. But again, just a quick aside, sure. we really had a real Rat Pack Satan. Sammy Davis Jr. was yep, a member. That's right. Mm-hmm. I, I was mm-hmm. about to mention that, sure. So um, That's awesome. That's a good get. <laughs> <laughs> and Jane Mansfield, and too. Jane, yeah. And Jane yeah. Mansfield. And, then, <laughs> and interestingly enough, Sinatra himself in a Playboy interview really talked about how religion was a farce. Yeah. So, it's like he and Sammy, we think, had some amazing conversations. Yeah. 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 I remember hearing about um, um, Jimmy Page and Anton LaVey. Just you know, well, he was more into Crowley, and he bought uh, uh, the Boleskine House and yeah, yeah, all of that. Like he was definitely into you know ritual magic and all of that. Sort yeah. Of thing. Well, when I, once I heard that when I was a kid, you know, my I, my dad basically fed me you know Jethro Tull, Led Zeppelin, and all those <laughs> classical you know classic rock bands. I was like, oh, he's got something to do with the devil. Man, I don't like that because <laughs> they told me I'm not supposed to like that. <laughs> but that, but that's why you did like that. Yeah. <laughs> The law of the forbidden. That's kind of that's right. That's th- and that's the appeal of of old Nick as well to this day. You know, when we have something in there that's a little off skew or a little like a nun or you know something that's not quite what you'll find in every other girly magazine. Right. It, mm-hmm. it, it really does better. Well, you tastes also change mm-hmm. over the course of mm-hmm. time. Like you start like if you find you can you know you, you shed that you know, weight of, you know, judgment and whatever. And then you start, you know, taking a peek at other, you know, things in life that you want to indulge in or whatever. And, you know, 
Well, that. I could definitely see this like sitting in any tattoo shop. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? Well, uh, tattoo shop, nothing. Yeah. I'm just that's you know that's you know, gonna be for me down here. I, <laughs> <laughs> when my wife is not home. I purposely <laughs> did not make it a typical porn mag mm-hmm. to work within the porn world as it stands in the last yeah. ten yeah. or fifteen years. You know, there's no there's no real full frontal nudity. Um, yeah, it's it's more like no boy girls. Yeah, stuff. Um, sensual, not as sexual. Kind it's of. it's again to tease. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because what you don't see. Yeah, because anybody often, can go on Pornhub and get whatever they course, want now. You know, you gotta you gotta set yourself of apart. Course. It a sparks bit, your you know. imagination yeah. more, which is you know the basis of eroticism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like this photo right here. She's you know, pale pale white in a bathtub of black ink. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. you know. It's awesome. Just a, just yeah. a, co- a cool concept yeah. in itself, just as a photo, yeah. you know, as an art photo. But, um, yeah, it's <laughs> can't wait to read the rest of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> and can't wait to read all of them. The articles, I mean. Yeah, no, I was, was going to say, there are good articles, too. <laughs> yeah, and there are quite a few articles. You know, we, we've interviewed some major people in the church, including Magus Gilmore, Peter, my good friend here. Uh, and many others, and we always have something in the back of the of the magazine called "What Sort of Man Reads Old Neck," and it mm-hmm. gives you a little bio of some of one of the of the guys who are doing. I think that one is uh, Adam Cardone, or yeah, did I give you that one? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but we do that a lot too. And yeah. you just won a alt porn award. Yes, we did. We won the alt porn award for best magazine, which was quite an accomplishment. We beat out, I think. Eight or nine other magazines, some of them tattoo t- magazines and um, another porn magazine. So we did we did quite well. You find it's difficult selling print. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have a like an online presence though? Oh uh, yeah, 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 I'm on. The yeah, I, I I checked out the site, but uh, you got to be like a member, right, to to really see a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's mm. kind of an antiquated thing, so it, it's evolving, mm. and I'll you know this is going to be. I'll give you a little uh, heads up here of some information that other people might not know even know yet. But Dead radio exclusive. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it's an exclusive. <laughs> um, Old Nick is going to be part of the new Satanic Warlock site. Okay. So the from the book, The Satanic Warlock, we've d- decided to develop this online presence, which is going to be a hub for Satanic men or any man who's interested in th- lifestyle kind of things, some sexy stuff, advice, things like that. And Old Nick is now going to be part of that whole website. So every issue of Old Nick will be archived on that site as well. So members w- who can who join the site will have access to all of, of the publications. Oh, so cool. a, that's sort of a side answer to your question: Is it is print difficult? Yeah, it is. Uh, people don't want to pay a lot mm-hmm. of money for a print magazine anymore when they can get it digitally. But we also have a digital presence mm-hmm. at at skinmags.com with video, so you can get it there too, and that'll continue. But it, it's not so much the product itself. It's not so much the tangible product that it's the idea. And the idea can grow. You know, things have grown out of Old Nick. We've done shows. You know, we've done, we're have done. we going to sponsor some new things, seminars, So oh, uh, along with Satanic Warlock. So Satanic Warlock sort of grew out of Old Nick in, in certain ways because what I was doing in Old Nick originally was – entertaining men and that meant sometimes giving them advice or giving them knowledge or imparting church of satan philosophy to them and that's what the satanic warlock did and that's what it'll continue to do so in effect the satanic warlock is is the next step and old nick is, will still be part of it what about the um the satanic uh the satanic witch what about it is there <laughs> is there like uh I live. My wife's a bit of a feminist, <laughs> so okay. I guess uh, we know we know we were going to go there. <laughs> my job we is we my job there. is to ask: Is there the other? Is the other side the, sa- the satanic? Yeah, let me boil it down real simple because this is a question that good, comes up because all the time. <laughs> my brain's not, so, not smart. My brain's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I always say. <laughs> um, the, the satanic witch liberated women back when it was read. It, it told women, basically, you have the power to get whatever you want in life by using your feminine wiles and your witchy ways. And the smart man will understand this and 
enjoy that and go along with it. And what's better than that when both parties get what they want? There's nothing wrong with that. So, you know, the fem feminist argument that, well, you're objectifying or you're not treating women as, as, as equals is not true in Satanism. I wouldn't say that's all feminist, though. I mean, no. She's pretty... She's very much n against like the kind of the bullying type, you know, men are evil type sh bullshit. Yeah. So, right. well, I guess I, I should have been a little bit more clear. Like you have old Nick and um, Satanic Warlock, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. coming out of that as a um, online presence, but the female side of that mm -hmm. as a like a the Satanic a Witch women's the magazine. The well, mm, the Satan's Playgirl. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there is something that the, the girls did, didn't they? Yeah, they, they did. did. We actually had some of our witches were doing a magazine. Uh, I think they only they did a few issues of it, and they may bring it back. Oh, but good. it was again, uh, you know, them kind of coming together and sort of adapting the principles from the Satanic Witch to you know the 21st century. Because what we have now, see, when when Anton Levy came out with the Satanic Witch originally, feminism was sort of taking women's traditional powers away by saying, well, you can't use what you've usually used yeah. to, to ensorcel men. And they were like... There was, was sort like, of like a desexualization yeah, that went along with it. exactly. Yeah. And so he said, no, 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 no. You can be as powerful as you want. You are men's yeah. equal, if not superior, in, in most cases. Yeah, you can be sexy if you want to, but you should right. also be able to vote and do all exactly. Those but yeah. don't But don't feel that you have to have that taken away from yeah. you. So we've gotten to a point now where it's sort of been beaten to death on some levels. I mean, still women aren't paid equally. That's This is an ongoing struggle in our society, but it's it's a broader societal issue that uh, there's been ingrained, you know, putting women down in so many aspects. And we're always supporting, like, women being treated, ab well, everybody being treated equally. Because, you know, again, uh, uh, the LGBTQ community has been oppressed in so many mm -hmm. ways. And we have, there's a, a, a gay magazine that we have now. It's a, it's put out by uh, Aden Arden, who uh, has written wrote a really interesting book, uh, Militant Eroticism, mm -hmm. and he presents that perspective. So suddenly he's got, you know, the second issue I think just came out. And it's he's called got, like, Horns. Yeah, Horns. And he put out the Satanic Warlock ca calendar, so there's, you know, <laughs> sexy hot warlocks who, that, you know, men and women can enjoy. And uh, so we, we try to cover all the bases. Yeah. It's, it's that everybody... The, you know, people used to call things like liberation movements in the past. You know, everybody needed a something liberation movement. And and Satanism has always been the ultimate liberation movement because it's all about being who you are and not to feel oppressed in yeah. any way, shape, or form. So so that we can sort of encourage all these things. And right now, also, the, the sort of adjunct to Bob's book, The Gay Satanic Warlock, is being written by a guy who uh, was going to be in the Catholic priesthood and moved away from that to be a computer programmer and uh, is now, you know, and he's gay, and he's going to write this whole book about his journey and how gay men can use their their warlock aspects to to be even more empowered oh. in the 21st century. Wow. You know, the, 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 sa the book that I have written, the, the, the Satanic Warlock, really does take a lot of these issues into, into consideration, especially in seduction and appeal of the sexes. And there's, this is really just a wake-up manual for men, for satanic men to say, this is the way it is. You know, take out all of the nonsense that you've been hearing. This is the way it, it is in the real world. And interestingly enough, I've not gotten one pushback letter from a woman about the book. Mm -hmm. Not one. W one was kind of, well, it's a little too... Red pill for me, and if you know what that is, it's mm -hmm. the whole pickup yeah. artist world. Mm -hmm. You know, red pill is extreme masculine. And blue. Anyway, it was a little too red pill, but I still enjoyed it because it, it hits home. No pushback from women because mm -hmm. they understand, they get it. This is just the way it is. Yeah. We had to rip apart all of the window dressing and understand how, you know, it's it's like uh, it's like the old song, you know. Uh, as time goes by, a kiss is still a kiss. Mm -hmm. These things still apply. So just wake up and do the same things. Well, yeah. Also, you, you were mentioning, too, that we've gotten responses that women like satanic warlocks because they're intriguing and exciting because they're men who are really self-realized mm -hmm. and that they're not a bunch of wimps who are like, well, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know how to do... Because I think women enjoy, you know, women who are confident like men who are confident Absolutely. for the most part. They, they want a good counterpart, mm -hmm. but somebody who can energize them. 
And I think his book can help a number of guys to do that, to, to find mm-hmm. a different kind of focus or to try something different mm-hmm. because th- there are different kind of archetypes, you know, based on physical abilities, mm-hmm. you know, shapes, body sizes, but, but, you know, different class kind of things that you might play with, something more rock star oriented, something more like blue collar. There's, you know, something very sophisticated or something even like piratical. There's all different kinds of archetypes that can be employed. And it could be exciting to a guy to say, you know, I've, I kind of like that. I've never tried that before. So let me go with that and see if that, you know, and see what kind of response I get. You might get somebody laughing at you, you but then you might find some other ladies yeah. following you home. You know, so it's kind of <laughs> like, yeah, it's, you know, because again, if you don't know all the aspects of yourself, it's a guide to help you explore those and, and to, to n- not leave things un, unexplored in yourself. Right. Mm. And it, it really pushes forth the idea of confidence. You know, confidence is the key. Confidence is the key to everything. And, you know, very simply, confidence is just practice, being expert in something. You know, if you're driving a car and you, you've you never driven it in the rain before and, you, you, drive, you know, you're afraid to drive it and you drive it in the rain and you get back safe. Drive it in the rain again, you're back safe again. Drive it in the rain third time, you're driving with one hand. That builds your confidence. So that's the cornerstone of what warlocks need to do. The way I, I describe it in the book, it's, it's the warlock self that has to be developed. And, and by the same token, it's a, bit of, it, it's a bitter pill of reality as well. I have something called the satanic masculinity meter in there, which is basically a, a chart with the different types of women and the type of men who will, can get them. You know, we all hear, well... I would love to, like, put you on that and just figure out where you're sitting. Well, that's (laughs) that's going through my head right now. I'm like, I want to take that test. (laughs) Right. Well, you know, it's pretty much saying, you know, unless you're... If you're rich, famous, you can probably have a Victoria's Secret model. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're taking the bus to work with a brown paper bag, lunch... Yeah, we're in a coffee shop. You're that, gonna, you're gonna date the girl <laughs> in the bookstore. What if you ride a bicycle and work at a coffee shop? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good luck. You're lucky. <laughs> good, good luck. But I'm, I'm not trying to say it's impossible for men to overcome this. You can, and there are exceptions. We have something in the archetypes called the everyman, who is not that, but somehow he has some other power. You know, his humor, his intelligence, his son. it can happen. But I wanted to, to have a real cold slap in the face to the guy saying, don't, be <laughs> so, don't get frustrated. Don't mm-hmm. s- try to keep getting these super hot chicks who are going to dump you in a heartbeat when you know that you're not going to get it. And you're going to just keep <laughs> getting rejected and feeling mm-hmm. like shit, and it's going to go on and on and on. So get real, first of all, mm-hmm. and then apply principles to get you to where you want to be. That's really the lesson. Mm. Be honest with yourself. You have to be honest. You, you have to be brutally honest. You guys should totally make like a satanic dating app. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that that would do Jesus well. Christ. That's called <laughs> Pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. Because they're like, which pile yeah. are you in? Which pile are you in? Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of swiping left or right, you swipe down. That's kind of yeah. like that's kind of what we base this sh- the, what we base this show off of is honesty too. Like this, you know, when these mics go on. I'm just, I just yep. I try not to hold back, and in that, you know, it, it translates to life too. At the same time, I find that if I'm trying to put on a face or I'm trying to act a certain way around a group of people who are where I'm not comfortable, if I have anxiety around, if I just, if I s- try to put on a show, it doesn't go over well. You and can't I fall apart. You can't bullshit confidence. No, mm-hmm. it's got to be there or it's not, and the mm-hmm. only way it gets there is by practice. Yeah, and you know, I've I found that. Also, just being, you know, just being honest with yourself and being you and being who you are. And bobbing ends your head up in that weird way. Yeah, you're just doing it. What are you well, doing? Well, but you see right here, <laughs> you're, you're demonstrating what's going on. Your confidence yeah. in what you do. But it translates. Yeah, that translates into confidence for me, at least. Right. You know, because when I see somebody who's just not afraid to be who the hell they are, that like, you know, that kind of pumps me up too. So I just I get mm-hmm. excited and uh, you know I want to join in with them, and you know their passion or whatever. But, um, yeah, that's, and, you know, coming back around, that's another th- thing about the church that I've, I've really come to just enjoy. I've watched, you know, all day today, just, you know, boning up, watching Anton LaVey. He's just sitting there 
with this asshole fucking interviewer. I can't remember the guy's <laughs> oh, name. Oh, Joe, Joe Pine. Jesus yeah. Christ. I want to reach through the... F- I wanted to go back in time. I want to invent a time machine, go back in time, and punch him in the face during that interview. <laughs> He's just being a douche. But um, Anton was just unfazed. He was just like, all right, fine. We'll talk about that, and then we'll just go on to the next thing, on to the next thing. He did not give a fuck. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So that's <laughs> where that... That's what that is. Yeah. No, you that's know, how that, you have to do it. You just have to keep going. Right. And you know, you know what you're talking about, and, and you know, I've encountered a lot of shit like that too. I'm, I've had some amazing people talk to me uh, over the years. You know, it was uh, with uh, Ahmed Zappa, we did a really funny thing, and Tom Likas, who was a real nasty guy, everybody is afraid of him and terrified. And when I went on his show, he was like, "Oh, he loved me." He's like, "Come back whenever you want. This is really cool. I can get into your philosophy." <laughs> and Jay Thomas on Sirius, I, you know, he had Kevin Meany on before he passed, and they were oh, afraid yeah, of me. Peace, and I mean, yeah. you know, and and people are terrified to go on Jay Thomas's show, and like afterwards, they're like, "Oh, well, you know, we, we liked him and we agreed mostly with him." So, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> but that I think that's kind mm-hmm. of the, the bottom line is that. Uh, we're not here to bullshit. We're not putting on a show. Mm-hmm. I mean, as as much as you know, when we do ritual and things like that, it is it's obviously show. We say it's a show, mm-hmm. but when we're talking about the way the world works, but, we're, we're really being earthy, carnal, down to but to again, the brass we, tacks. When you're putting on the show, you're being honest and saying this is just a show. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's you know, no hocus pocus. Yeah, it is what it is. Real quick, what do you feel about circumcision? Uh, sh- circumc- <laughs> I don't circumcision. think one should do that to a kid, uh, you know, because it's his body. You know, it don't, you don't. There are people I know who've had it done in adulthood because they felt it was going to be better, huh. and you know. The only reason but, that but, stuck is you're talking about baptism and everything. Yeah, yeah. Early yeah, yeah. Like, no, I, I don't think you should mutilate anybody against their will. Mm-hmm. I think there should be law: not no circumcision under anyone less than five inches. <laughs> 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 you got to keep, you know. You gotta keep uh. what you got. You can't be shaving points. That's right. You, you, if you're less, you can't. You, you can't give up. Hold on to every inch. That's right. <laughs> yeah, my uh, I don't know. It's, uh, my uh, my sister in law just got married. Her and a girlfriend are having a baby, and they're having a boy. So I was like, the other night I was, you know, we got that big pile of stuff on our table. It was all all their, you know, gifts and everything like that. And I'm looking at all of them. And I'm like, what are they gonna do about the circumcision? <laughs> oh boy, I got a question to ask because I could like you know over well, the look, years. It's just you know there there is a medical situation. I, I also hold a doctorate in human sexuality, so I know a bit about this. All right, there is medically speaking, in well, not to get too graphic, but under Do the it. foreskin, there's a dildo on the table. Yeah, there, under <laughs> the, men you build, could demonstrate. Uh, this is disgusting. It's a circumcised dildo. <laughs> too. Men. men <laughs> Men will build up smegma under the foreskin. Mm-hmm. It's just a natural thing. And if, if it's cleaned continually every day, maybe twice a day, you're fine. If you're not, then it can cause medical problems. There's also a condition where the foreskin becomes too tight. It's a, like a preopus type thing where it becomes yeah, too tight. Yeah. And when yeah. it retracts, the skin will actually break. This was a common thing that went on in, in the days of AIDS and a lot of men got circumcised then yeah. so as not to bleed in the yeah, situation. The um I had I had read quite a bit about this because mm-hmm. um yeah I'm gonna have kids so it's gonna a decision that I have to and I am circumcised if anyone cares. Um are you under five inches? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um the, there have been a lot of studies done about um, AIDS in Africa, and the transmission is a lot less when people are circumcised mm-hmm. without a condom. That's right. So uh, I feel like that's a medically valid, and it's statistically proven. It's something that you can show numbers. But when it really comes down to it, it's your kid, your values, it's your decision. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. uh, it, All you can do as a doctor is say, these are the reasons why you might want to do it. It's your decision. Yeah. I don't think religion should have anything to do with it. No, no. <laughs> well, what was interesting is uh, a coworker of mine. Uh, she was uh, going to have a kid, and was uh, when she went with uh, her husband to the doctor to sort of discuss that very topic. He said, "Well, what's what's your what's the husband like? Because you know <laughs> you're going. He's going to see you." You and do you want your kid to feel the same or different from your husband? Mm. Ah. Because that's a thing. Like it's like if yeah. daddy looks one way and you look another, then it's like, well, is that good or bad or weird? It, it's mm. an issue. And then he also said, uh, and do you want him to get head? Uh, so, 
So maybe you know he was so the husband was circumcised, and he said you might want to go that way. Yeah. Uh, but but you know but you know all joking aside, it is something that you know there are different mm-hmm. aspects to it mm-hmm. that you have to think about and consider. Yeah, I did have a conversation with someone. I, I won't mention her name, but it was a while back, and she had just had a baby, and she was really pushing back. Her husband wanted to have the baby circumcised, and she did not. And I was having a conversation with them while they were still making the decision. She she hadn't given birth yet. And I said to her, I was like, have you ever been a man? Have you ever had a penis? Like, that's, uh, to be honest, I think this is a call that dad needs to make. He's the only one with any real life experience for that. <laughs> and she was like, oh, I feel like such an asshole. Because <laughs> of all the times she has said to him while she was pregnant, you don't know how I feel. And <laughs> it, it just, and turn. yeah, she, she wound up, uh, I don't know what they did, but she agreed to go with the father's decision. So that was fun. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, definitely no, no, no mutilation of the body yeah. based on religious principles. We definitely yeah. stand with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Makes sense to me. <laughs> so we've been, we've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes about. Uh, did you guys want to take a break or you want to keep going? It's up to you. Whatever yeah. is, 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 is good yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah we can keep going. Um, so we've got a few people checking in. Uh, Oh my god. It's a bunch of nonsense. So Tony's an idiot. We're not reading any of his uh responses. So um Anthony from work uh asks, sorry if this was covered, but how do you join the Church of Satan? Oh, it's it's easily uh, explained yeah. on the website. Yeah. Uh, but for us it's just a, a two hundred dollar membership fee and it's for a lifetime membership. Mm-hmm. You do it with PayPal, it's two hundred and eight because it has a fee yeah, for yeah. doing things like that. Uh, but that's all that we ask for people for money. It's it's like most religions actually tithe you on some level. You know, you're yeah, giving constantly. Yeah, someone said, uh, do they send around a collection like at church, but instead of money, do you pay in blood? No. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been paying attention to the conversation? I don't know who this person is. Well, it's always, that's always, but yeah. people like to fantasize that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think part of the, the reason that people become interested in, because they, they have watched horror movies mm-hmm. and they're like, well, is it really like that? And when you go back to something as interesting as Rosemary's Baby, which the author Ira Levin wrote because he was influenced by the press that the Church of Satan was receiving, and he was like, well, what if the next-door neighbors were Satanists? And what if they, if there really was a Satan and you could make a baby for Satan, which is not what the Church of Satan was saying, but that's where his thought yeah. led him. But when that book came out, the publicists of that and the movie that was then in the works, because it happened like immediately, they went from book and mm-hmm. movie was going to come out, they approached the Church of Satan and said to Anton LaVey, could you help publicize this? And he was like, sure, you know, you got to pay me, of course. Yeah. And uh, they did. And Because Satanists are pragmatic. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and what, uh, you know, he, they did is they, they put out a press release that kind of hinted that Anton LaVey may have played the devil in the movie. And they said, look, we know you didn't, but go along with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's like, sure, you know, you can hint all you want and people can freak out and, and worry about it. But they actually had him do a publicity stunt in San Francisco where when the movie was premiered there, they had him show up in a black limo with a guys in robes, and they all came into the one of the premiere sh- screenings, and then there was press there to ask questions about Satanism, and they made buttons. Around the country, the advertising campaign was Pray for Rosemary's Baby, but the buttons they made for that were Pray for Anton LaVey. Mm-hmm. Those are very rare. I do have some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, th- th- the, the whole point is that years later, people tried to say, well, you know, Anton LaVey tried to piggyback on that and, and somehow was lying about this, and... and you know, we have all the correspondence. We, you know, we yeah. know exactly what went on. And it was like, no, they asked him to help publicize it. They actually suggested that, asked him mm-hmm. to go along with it. And he's like, whatever you want to do. You know, you're mm-hmm. paying me nicely. This is fine. Mm-hmm. But the the book was influenced by the Church of Satan quite clearly. Yeah. Hmm. When did that co- I'm, I'm trying to find out when Rosemary's Baby came out. Oh, that was the in 68. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, could that have fed into the whole satanic panic thing well the the, that was much later and, and yeah the, what started the satanic panic were christian evangelists trying to right, drum up this right, idea right, right. like first there was a uh, uh, michelle remembers where a guy hypnotized a woman who later became his wife and she started to say that a group actually called the church of satan was like had been for years like molesting her and mutilating her and abusing her and uh the Church of Satan actually, and Anton LaVey sued them and got them to take the references to the Church of Satan out of the book. Uh, oh, so it's like most people don't know about that. But that was like the seminal book, this idea that there was some kind of hidden group that was taking people in against their wishes and doing terrible things to them. 
Right after that, this book came out called The Satan Seller, a guy named Mike Warnke, who was an evangelical Christian. He had also been like a really messed up drug user, and he started to say, well, there's a satanic cult that's much darker and scarier than the Church of Satan, and they're global, and that they actually have demons that will teleport you, and they do rituals where they cut off, you know, you'd put your finger down, and they'd cut off the end of it, and everybody would eat your little fingertip. And it was just just nutty stuff. Mm-hmm. But How many people is a fingertip going to feed? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but people <laughs> ate that up, especially the Christians. And <laughs> no see, pun intended. Figuratively. Yeah. Figuratively <laughs> ate it up. There became this whole network of, of evangelicals oh, pushing this idea to scare <laughs> folks into their, uh, their religion. It's like, oh, well, you know, you got to join our church and pay our dues or else the devil's going to get you or the devil's minions. And it was so funny because, like, we, we used to call this stuff Geraldo Satanism because what Geraldo did is put, like, every friggin' week you know, some new show about somebody who was like either putting graffiti under a bridge or it's, you know, was in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And and the, the absurdity of this, that it could go from, you know, molesting kids at a daycare center and all of those cases like McMartin, which is still, I think, the most expensive trial in the United States history, that we're, we're, it was actually an alcoholic woman who talked some kid into saying, you know, nonsense and made claims, and, they, and they're and they like, oh, there are tunnels under the daycare center, and kids are being taken to Mexico, yeah. and, and it was like, there was, there's no way any of this could actually happen. It was all fantasy, but there was such a craziness, This his, and that's why we call it the satanic panic. It was a hysteria mm-hmm. that happened where the, the, you know, the media got into it because it was, it was easy. It was like they got huge yeah. ratings. I went on all these shows, and they would put me in a separate green room because everybody was afraid of me. Like, well, he's the Satanist. Maybe he's, like, taking kids away and having them mutilated and sacrificing babies. And they'd have some white trash girl come out and go, I had babies for Satan, and I killed all of them. And it's like, mm, you know, the statute yeah. on murder doesn't go away. Yeah. So if you really have, you're going to be in jail, honey. Uh, <laughs> and then there'd be all these people... Claiming, to, you know, they'd be sort of loosely associated with police departments. And what they did is they made a living being cult cops. Like, they'd consult with police departments. And they charge police departments like $125 a head for, for like, a class of, you know, 75 police officers where they'd buy, like, the satanic Bible. And, like, they'd go to the local occult store and buy, like, a, a fake skull and some shit like that. And they well, we found this at a crime site. And they'd give all these lectures and just saying absolute bullshit, just sort of made up or mm-hmm. pulled out of all different kind of, you know, old books about witchcraft and occultism. And they made a fortune, and then people bought into that. And the major evangelists, they kept promoting it. And those books are still, I mean, most of them are out of print at this point. But it was kind of crazy. And it wasn't until the FBI really got into it. And, and, and in, mm-hmm. it was happening in Europe, too. And all the investigative agencies over there pooled their work with the folks here. And we in the Church of Satan consulted with these people. Anton LaVey did, I did. We were always working with the FBI and law enforcement people to say, no, this is what this really is. We'll help interpret symbols if there's crimes that are weird. We'll help mm-hmm. point out what this is related to or that it's just bullshit, like, oh, that's a video game. You know, there's nothing yeah. real here. Because you know, they don't know. Like, they, they come to these things and they see something weird, and it's like, oh, no, that's Santeria or that's, you know, Palo Mayombe, the, you know, these other religions that aren't Christian or might be derived. They're Afro-Caribbean syncretist religions. They might be using symbols like that. Somebody's putting a curse on somebody. They, you know, pull a chicken head off or they've got, a, you know, a, a cauldron full of bones and skulls that they've stolen from a graveyard, you know, and like Palo Mayombe. And, but, but everybody's like, it's Satanism, it's Satanism. And it's like, no, 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 it's not. And that same thing is happening right now with uh, that, that M13 gang. Uh, because, MS-13. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 MS, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's it, MS-13. Yeah. Like, because they're interested in the Santa Muerte cult, which is really something that's derived from Christianity. Christianity has saints, and throughout Central and South America, the idea of mixing local pagan gods with the Christian saints has been forever since, like, the conquistador showed up. It actually mm-hmm. started. So this sort of skeleton goddess, which the people who are her worshippers really believe she exists and can and can do wishes, you know, grant things, but she does it for, like, actually darker desires. So big with the drug dealers and also big with, like, outsiders, like gay people and uh, and other folks that are, are marginalized, but they, they worship this skeleton goddess who looks like death. But of course, all the police who don't know about this at all, they're like, it's Satan, it's Satanism. And it's like, it isn't. You need to consult religious scholars to really understand unusual religions. And just because it's an unusual religion doesn't mean it's criminal, but with where this is concerned, there are criminal gangs using this as like a main symbol for, for what they're doing. So... You know, th- that's always the, the issue. Like, why we work with law enforcement is that to help them focus and not misinterpret things and be condemning people for something that they just don't, don't even understand. Hmm. <clears throat> that's, it goes back to fear. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Not under, you know. And also that wanting to, that scapegoat wanting to assign blame to something that's not in your control. Yeah. Exactly. You know, exactly. It, it, like the um, West Memphis Three, those guys went to prison for 20 years or longer, actually, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what it really comes down to is some pedophile raped and killed a couple of kids. And they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong right. time. They're the local weirdos. Yeah. We blame yeah. it on them. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it's like that textbook. You interrogate somebody who doesn't understand what's going on. Eventually, they'll tell you what you what you want to hear. Oh, yeah. Well, th- that was the whole thing during the panic because there were all these people claiming to be therapists mm-hmm. who would do these kind of interrogations of kids. And they would lead mislead them. them. Yeah. yeah. They, they'd take out like dolls and say, okay, so what did he do to you what, when he touched you here? Not yeah. like, did he touch you or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was all completely leading testimony. And, and again, when they examined all of the tapes, yeah. you know, videos and, and, and audio tapes, it became very clear. And then so yeah. it evaporated. But it went on for years. And there was even a point where Congress was examining a bill to outlaw Satanism, make it illegal. Yeah, It was in the middle of when I'm doing a lot of talk shows, and it was just, mm. you know, I've got to be out there. Yeah. You know, I did. Uh, it's just that that is unconstitutional. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. The, the fear was so great. That that was proposed and yeah. seriously considered. Yeah, and that's worked so well in the past when you ban <laughs> religions. <laughs> yeah, works out so great. You have like plagues and stuff. You know, <laughs> it's in the Bible. Didn't you read it? <laughs> <laughs> How's the reception been in the Hudson Valley? Because I mean, first and foremost, we're we like to concentrate on local stuff. And yeah, and, and one question that I I did have before, but it didn't really work in the conversation is: Do you like congregate? Do you have, no, actually, yeah. not not specific. See, we're mm. we're a non congregational religion. We're not about yeah. meetings because we're so individualist. Yeah. We don't expect members of the Church of Satan to even like each other because again, <laughs> people are have so many different pursuits that we've done a few major conclaves. Like we did one for the 50th anniversary here in Poughkeepsie. Mm-hmm. It was huge, uh, and then when we, we did one the year before in Washington D.C. as well, we sort of bracketed the whole 50th anniversary year by doing two major gatherings, and a lot of people came together. And a lot of people found out that they loved other people, and a lot of people found out they didn't love <laughs> a lot of other people. So, and that's to be expected. And we always say that to folks. And people, when they join, suddenly think, "Well, I want to get together with other, you know, local people who are like-minded." And we say, "Deal with each other on social media, you know, go to lunch or something." But you necessarily may not really like them. You might not really share anything beyond Satanism in common. And the whole point to us is that you have to have more than that in common to actually develop some kind of relationship with mm-hmm. folks. So yeah, no, we don't really we don't do meetings. But you know, we're local and we're friends like here. Yeah. So. We hang out, uh, you know. We we do you know dinners, barbecues. We do film screenings. Uh, actually, we'll we'll play music and teach people about it because my degrees are in music composition. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have some so. of your old recordings have been remastered and everything. They're yeah, up on the, yeah. They're it's up on the website. You might group. take a take a listen. But um, and yeah, going back, how's been, how's the reception been from the community here? Or, or has there been? There hasn't been any problems. You know, mm-hmm. th- it, what's funny is that th- like articles have popped out, and then you sort of look at the comments that come up, and some people are like, "Ah, they've been here for a while. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you're late to the party." I, I feel like if you set up some sort of a brick and mortar place where people were meeting, then you're yeah. going to have that. You know, the whole NIMBY argument in not my backyard, but you know, being that you're just a person that lives here that happens to be the leader of this. Right. It's right. probably a little bit different. Well, the fun you know? thing is that there's, you know, like Bob's house, you know, my house is really like mm-hmm. a beacon. It's like the yeah. biggest, sat- it's a four story satanic monument. Like it's not hiding anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no in the closet here with that. And Bob's house is, is decorated in you know wonderful way. He's got like gargoyles and it's painted beautifully. And there's a naked Venus in the backyard that you can see. So it's, it's again, we don't hide anything that we are and people usually find it interesting. Like, our house is, is probably one of the most photographed houses in all of Poughkeepsie, yeah. which means don't come out on the porch in your underwear, because you never know who's <laughs> going to be out there with a camera. Uh, but but there is, you know, been very positive reaction to us. Like, people, when I painted the house and landscaped it and all of that, everybody came by and was like, wow, can, can you consult on my house colors, too? Yeah, <laughs> Like, there was no... I mean, once in a while, somebody would be hostile. But the, the funny thing is, when I bought the house the buildings department people sort of dragged me in a back room and surrounded me. Mm-hmm. And they were, what do you intend to do with this house? Uh, that they're going to make some temple or well, something? I, don't, I, I think they yeah. didn't even do any research enough to even do that because the house had had bids on it by some of the local slumlords. Mm-hmm. And it had been a crack house mm-hmm. and a place, you know, a rooming, illegal rooming house. So I think they kind of thought I might be another one. You know, I'm coming from New York City. You know, I'm one of those yeah. city slickers who's coming up here to take advantage of the Hicks and Poughkeepsie kind of mm-hmm. thing. 
So I think they thought that I was just going to you know, do the same thing that these other people were doing. That's probably what it was. I got grilled from my house because mm-hmm. I got grilled by my neighbors for this house. Yeah. Like, so, I see you're doing a lot of work in there all the time. <laughs> you guys oh, yeah. planning on staying? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm fucking stuck here for at least five years. So, but yeah, yeah I think you're just going to get grilled no matter what, yeah. especially if it was like, uh, you know... <laughs> So they weren't. Are so they weren't the weren't really standout. questioning you about your, you know, the Satanism part. Well, it was I, more about. Uh, yeah. Well, see, yeah. the thing is, I brought that up mm-hmm. to them because I said, "Well, this is America. I can do what I want with my house." Uh, mm-hmm. Although they did pass a law against being able to paint your house in that if they could they could call it one of historical interest and then they could tell you what you had mm-hmm. to do. Yeah. And I had actually kind of prepared because I studied Victorian painting techniques and colored palettes and all that. And I went and looked at all the historic houses and most of them are incorrect. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I was like, if you're going to give me any grief, I'm going to yeah. really come down with you about yeah, all these yeah. other ones. Make them repaint everything. Yeah. <laughs> but but I said, look, you know, it's this my wife and I and our, you know, dog are going to live here and she passed the dog passed away and we now have two. Uh, but uh, I said, that's it. We're going to be here for the long haul. We bought this house. We spent a lot of effort and money in restoring it. We're getting other people to move here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so we, we are, uh, you know, an active part of, of rehabbing Poughkeepsie, of making a commitment. And, and, and in, in addition, like, I'm actually pretty well known. And if you give me any kind of really stupid grief, I have access to media that you folks don't. Yeah. So... Do think twice before you do anything foolish when dealing with me. So they were like, cool. And, you know, and, and some of them really liked what I did, and some people did freak out. Uh, but it's like, hey, it's America. It's my house. I can do what I want. And, I, and I've inspired other people. You can see that there's been a, other painted lady kind of things happening since I've done mine that are kind of more in, unusual colors, like purples and bright colors and greens and oranges and things. So it's kind of nifty that... Uh, you know, by being bold with what I did, people will say, well, if he did that, then we mm-hmm. could do this. And I think that's kind of awesome that people are taking these old houses and fixing them up and really making them exciting again. Mm-hmm. Because what I always tell people is that I wanted to feel every time I walked up to my house excited. Like, mm-hmm. that's where I live. Isn't this awesome? And I want to feel that every single time. Yeah. And I would say, like, wouldn't you like to feel that way about your place? <laughs> like, you know, isn't it? And if it's just white or something, it's like, well, isn't that just the beginning? Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of colors out my there. My house and- is white, buddy. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I actually doesn't have to stay that way. I, I actually made made new friends with my house when I was um, shooting photos for the book, the Satanic Warlock. I had two models who decided to go out on my my back deck in their lingerie in the middle of the day, and the next day I, I had made three new friends on the block. <laughs> guys who came up and said, well, what, what, how, "How are you? What are you doing? Now? What do you do for a living? Uh, go, go mow your lawn." <laughs> How long have you been in the area? Uh, it'll be four years in four October. Four years? Mm-hmm. You enjoy it here as well? I do, yeah. It's a great place to live, and it's beautiful. And I, you know, I've lived in the city. My wife and I lived in the city for many years, and I m- moved out to uh, L.A. in 2000 to work for Playboy. And then um, after that, moved to Vegas because I thought it would be a cool place to live for a while and maybe do a little semi-retired thing there. But it was quite boring and i really did want to get more involved with with the church central and to to get uh closer to my friends up here and it was it was a good thing because it's far enough away from the city where we don't have to be bothered but close enough to go down if we really want to right uh and it you know i look at myself now as a country gentleman sort of (laughs) i I don't know how many people in poughkeepsie think of themselves (laughs) I guess it is it is a big difference between living down there and up here. But it's a yeah. it's a huge difference. Yeah, we I mean we're we've pretty much been locals forever. We grew up in, you know, t- your town of Poughkeepsie, I was Wappingers, so just south of here. Um, same shit. But <laughs> yeah. I we, we love this town and I'm glad to see that there are people moving here and making it better. Yeah. That's the key. Because yeah. Poughkeepsie's been kind of a shithole for a long time. Yeah. And I'm starting to see it, it we're starting to see it turn a cor- finally turn a corner. And I'm um, just interested to see what happens in the future. And that's when we when we found out that you were here. I was like, "Oh, this is so cool! This is something else, something yeah. more for this area. Like that just gives more intrigue and more, you know, you know, just what well, enriches culture." It, you know. Yeah. We, we've been wanting that too. I mean, as we moved up here, like we, you know, we lived in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. We could walk to like the best restaurants in, in no time, and we kind of got really used to that. And when we come up here, we're like, "So what do we got up here?" 
And it's like, okay, Main Street is developing. It's easy mm -hmm. for us to walk there. And then we've got the Culinary Institute, which is like seven minutes by car, mm -hmm. which is kind of awesome. So it, it, we've got like... The crafted all... Cup on Raymond Avenue in Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, we've got all <laughs> kinds of great stuff going on that, that's really bringing this, this area up. And some things fail, uh, but then somebody else will step in and say, okay, what didn't work with that? And I think that's what we, we keep hoping, that, that uh, you know, things are going to step up. People are going to have, like, house pride and make their houses look cool. Because I've been, I've been taking pictures of a lot of houses around Poughkeepsie because I'm probably going to do a little website about that, how people are renovating them and making them interesting. Oh, wow. So, uh, you know, it, it's – but that, that's the whole thing is we definitely are in here for the long haul. Our friend Joe was in here from, you know, much longer. And he when he got his house, he used to have to screw gun the door shut when he left because the neighborhood was so bad. And he got wow. uh, Connie Corso, you know, to, to having his uh, back, you know, his dog because if people broke, people would break into his house. Mm -hmm. And he'd have to get, you know, get them chased out, you know, use a dog to do that because, like, people didn't care. And he couldn't even get his mail. It was like in, you know, the zone where we are, which is like not far from Main Street, was one that the post office wouldn't even deliver mail to. Wow. So, so this is how much it's changed in these years. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he kind of was the, the pioneer. And when we came up and, and saw his place, we were like, wow, this is an awesome house. And how did you do this? Because, I mean, we were Manhattan dwellers in an apartment, you know, for, for you know, decades. So we're like, we kind of would like to do this, too. And then we, we walked our dog, and we saw this house down the street, and we're like, oh, that's the one. We really want that. So it, we got to that point where we're like, okay, this is something we could do. And uh, with my wife retiring and, and, you know, savings and such that we had, we were like, all right, let's make it happen. We will buy the house. And uh, turn it into something that will be really something that will make us excited for the rest of our years here. Mm. Yeah, this is our first home. It's just like it almost just now settling in. And I was like, holy shit, this is a, it's finally coming together. A lot of outside stuff to do, but that's neither here nor there. Um, um, community events, anything like that? Do you guys throw, or you know, just kind of stay? Just well, we we participate in interesting things that are going on up here. Mm -hmm. It's like you know that new farmers market that's going on down by the, the riverfront is really nice. Mm -hmm. We like to shop down there. We we like to patronize all the good businesses ar around here. Yeah. That's I think because we're about living well. You know, we like to get good foods, and you go to Adams, you go to these other yeah, places, yeah, yeah. and you can. And Adams even did that great fence around my house, uh, <laughs> you know, because they do all these kind of awesome things. So, yeah, uh -huh. Adams, and and <laughs> trees. Like I landscape my property. Bob did too. Adams did the trees for us. So uh, you know, it's kind of again using who's local that's really good, and going to the local towns. I mean, you, you can go up to you know Rhinebeck or something, and or uh, Red Hook, and there's good things. And I, I since I'm a classical music guy. Uh, I like to hear good classical music, and the Bard, Bardavon yeah, has absolutely. a great, the Hudson Valley Philharmonic is wonderful, and I also go to Bard College and hear uh, the orchestra now that plays there, uh, that's, uh, you know, the, the, it's like graduate students and then undergraduate students, they have two orchestras mm -hmm. there, beautiful concert hall designed by Frank Geary, who's one of the world's major architects, great acoustics, so it's like I got, like, awesome classical music up here, you know, one place I can walk to, like I used to walk to Carnegie Hall, because I lived near there. And uh, it's fantastic. So Poughkeepsie just has so much to offer. We're just really happy to be here and, and to, to be part of what's going on. Well, happy you guys. You guys are here. Thank We're you. We're very happy. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Add, add a little spice to the mix. We um, appreciate it. Real quick, I wanted to talk about um, uh, Devil's Reign 3. Mm -hmm. um, you sent us a link that's going to be out. Um, it's actually uh, pre-order sales begin August 1st. And it's a pub art publication of... Is it, it's monsters influenced by mythology and yeah yeah see what we what, what I did is several years ago uh, I met Andy Howell who's a kind of an entrepreneur down at Fort Myers because mm -hmm. I have a summer place down there. well actually it's it's more of it's supposed to be more of a winter place but we go down in the fall mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, I actually hadn't even known him I've been going down there for years my wife and I and then a friend of ours Thomas Thorne who was the guy who did the Electric Hellfire Club band. He's, he told me once, I'm go there's a Frank Frazetta show at this local place. And, you know, like, and I'm like, oh, well, Frank Frazetta, awesome, right? So we went to see his art and met Andy, who runs the, the tattoo parlor and art gallery. And so he was like, I'm going to do something with you. Like, we got to do something together. And so this is the end of the one year. And then immediately in January, he's like, okay, okay, we got to really get something going. Because that's what he's, his real kind of go-to guy. And so I said, well, why don't we do an art show that's based on the infernal names in the satanic bible because they're from all these different cultures and they could be illustrated really vividly so we did we, we did an art show called the devil's reign and it's you know not like the movie the devil's reign that mm -hmm. anton LaVey did but it means the devil's rule like plural and a ruling 
So uh, it was a success. We got all kinds of great people. A lot of famous tattoo artists participated. And uh, the, the show traveled uh, also up to Boston and uh, got great press. So the next year we were like, okay, he's like, what are we going to do next? So I said, well, because Thomas Thorne introduced us and his band is sort of this sort of psychedelic satanic band, I said, we're going to do psychedelic blasphemy for the second one. And we're going to make this the, the summing up of the Electric Hellfire Club. So they did their final performances for this show. And we did a thing up in Tampa, and then we did one at the gallery space. And the gallery space now has a stage, and they have stuff going on every week there. It's like the place to be. And all the local culture publications in Fort Myers have like, they put them up on a pedestal. It's like saying... Howell Gallery, the, the great place. If you want to go someplace cool, and just a, around the corner from them is the the, um, the Bury Me Brewery, and they're this awesome place that makes micro brews. Uh, Bill Vaughn uh, does; he's the brewmaster, and so for each of those two shows, we created a special. He created a special beer. He would talk to me about the different kinds of beer that I enjoyed, and he's really perceptive and has a great, you know, discriminating sense of taste. So uh, we did two awesome beers, and like the did the albums. Uh, I mean the uh, Labels have, like, sort of caricature art of me. So the third show is now going to be Daikaiju, which in Japanese means giant monsters. Yeah, I wasn't about to try and pronounce that. I yeah. don't want to butcher it. <laughs> so, but, but we, you haven't seen Pacific Rim? Uh, oh, I, yeah. 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 And the new one should, you yeah, know, it's, I can't it's, wait. it's in the works. I kind of so rolled good. my eyes for, like, it's two hours. so that movie. good. <laughs> I, like uh, I love it. <laughs> I just watched it the other night again. Yeah. Uh, but th- we're really in a, in a renaissance of giant monster movies. Like, I've always been a Godzilla fan because Godzilla is a great symbol. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he means, like, the power of nature that responds to man's interference. Yeah. And that's a, a great symbol. And the thing is, with uh, the movies more recently, you know, the Gareth Edwards Godzilla was very successful. And so Legendary now has their monster verse. So the, the, the one that they're filming right now is going to have, you know, King Ghidorah and Rodan and Mothra in it to be fighting with Godzilla. And already they're planning the one to follow that up is Godzilla versus King Kong. So they did Kong Skull Island to introduce their Kong, yeah. who is much bigger than uh, most King Kongs. And. Uh, uh, you know, Adam Wingard is going to direct that one, and uh, Doherty's doing this one. What they do is they give these younger directors a shot to have this like huge yeah, blockbuster sure. movie, and it's really smart because they work their asses off to put everything that they can into it. It's not like somebody who's bored or you know, their career, you're like, ah, I'm doing a stupid monster movie. It's like, no, they get these guys who really give like absolutely all that they have, and it's very smart. And you know, Toho in Japan was stimulated to to step back up because they hadn't done a Godzilla movie in forever. You know, they had given it to the Americans to do in 1998, and that's sort of... You just keep fucking it up. Yeah, (laughs) well, that one did. Um, (laughs) Cool design for a monster, but it didn't act like Godzilla. Uh, But, uh, you know, they stepped back in after the the Gareth Edwards one was happening, because Edwards was going to do a sequel, but then he got invited to a Star Wars movie. So he's like, well, you know, how can I turn Mm -hmm. that down? So they said, all right, well, when you're done with that, you can come back and do the Godzilla movie. And then when... He was getting out of the stars movie. He said, "Look, dudes, I'm burned out. Two giant blockbusters in a row. I need some time off." So then they said, "Okay, cool. We'll get somebody else to to take this on." But the Japanese said, "Oh, well, this is too much of a gap between 2014 and 2018, or no, it's 2019. I think that the Godzilla movie is coming out." So they're like, "We need to do something else." And they got the craziest guys in Japan who are super fans of giant monsters and the whole tokusatsu, you know, making the the, the rubber suits and the miniatures. They've they've created a museum of that, like they're so into it, but they've also done other things. Like uh, the special effects guy Higuchi had done the Gamera trilogy in the '90s, which is really kind of awesome. Gamera is always like this dopey turtle and done for kids, <laughs> but the '90s movies are serious and really awesome. Yeah. If you haven't seen them, like and you like giant monsters, go see the '90s Gamera movies directed by Kaneko and uh, uh, Hideki Anno, who d- did the Evangelion animes, which are really psychotic and bizarre he wrote and directed this new film and he got to just do crazy shit with it. They were like, do something different. And he's like, really? Like, how different? You know, and he sort of came up with this this wild idea of a Godzilla that's in three different forms. Actually, ultimately has like five forms and it totally doesn't look like Godzilla. It's a new creature. It's a totally new mythology for it. It's ugly and creepy. And for the first time, they did it all with CGI. Like Toho braved it. They made a puppet that they were going to use, and they had done some stuff like that for the live action. Um, oh, what are they called? Movies, the ones with the giants eating people. I uh, can't think of it right now. But uh, giants. Eating oh, um, Attack on Titan. Yeah, Attack yeah. on Titan. Because the, the guy who did the special effects of the Godzilla rich. movie, he, <laughs> Glad he you're here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he directed both those live action films, and they used some puppetry for that that was enhanced with CGI. I never I never saw the live action. Oh, Attack on it's Titan. pretty creepy. It's, yeah, 
the, the and the the second uh, season of the uh, anime is available. Mm-hmm. I think now. Yeah, I watched the whole first season. I didn't know the second one's yeah, available. Yeah, I think it's. But it's... I, I always wanted to see the movie, but it's just it's not really a. Uh, readily available yeah there are two two of them and you know like a first and second part but it's awesomely creepy but Mm. when they started actually they tried to do some puppetry stuff for the new godzilla film and it really wasn't working so they they Mm. just said all right we'll do motion capture like they do for the you know Mm -hmm. the like did for jackson's king kong and the for the planet of the apes movies to get like the sense of how godzilla would move and everything was animated and Mm -hmm. it was they did some miniature work but not a huge amount but it's awesome. Like the Toho really stepped it up. It looks you can watch it against like other major movies, and it's not embarrassing. It doesn't look cheesy. You know, there's a couple of things that are like oh, it looks a little like video gamey here and there because they don't have the budgets that that American movies do. But it was like wow, pretty impressive and cool. And so they're contractually obligated not to do another live action movie until Legendary is done with theirs, yeah. their next two. But they said, okay, but nobody can stop us from doing an anime. So for the very first time, they're, we're going to have Godzilla anime called Monster Planet that takes place you know, thousands of years in the future. Like mankind has been driven off Earth and is coming back and has made friends with other aliens. And Godzilla has dominated Earth and his genetics have permeated all of the animal life. So Earth is now the monster planet that's dominated by Godzilla and all of his you know, related species. So now it's Starship Troopers. You're Pretty much, about. it's kind of in that direction, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and there's another Starship Troopers coming out too. This is uh, there really? Yeah, yeah. yeah I heard. Jesus, they're uh, just like, rebooting I heard the hell out of everything. No, I don't think it's a reboot. No, no, it's it's, it's it's a, it's a it's a yeah. It's because yeah. I don't think it's sequel. I think it's probably like the fifth one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got all. <laughs> we of watched them. the sequel yeah. at yeah, yeah. Uh, Robeth. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It was great. <laughs> yeah, the first one is still the best in that. Yeah, but I I heard. The guy who played Rico's signed on to oh, the yeah, he's, he's yeah. voicing yeah, it. Yeah, Casper Van Dien. Christ. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be like a CG <laughs> yeah, movie, yeah. right? Well, there there yeah. is there already is one. Oh, I haven't one seen of the, that. Yeah, so that came out a couple of years ago, and then so this oh, will be no, like I, that. I did. Yeah, I did see that because uh, the the one of the girls had like a a, a Barrett sniper rifle. Yeah. Where does all this monster talk rate on the scale for uh, s- the satanic <laughs> man? <laughs> get me what kind off. of chicks can I get with yeah, monster get, talk? Get me off planet nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you over there. I was like, Tony oh, finally said something funny, but I'm not going to read it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, where are we here? Yeah, we're closing in on the two-hour mark, so yeah. I think it's... If we want to we, we wind it down. Yeah, I would say so. I... I don't know. I I appreciate you guys coming on. This is lightning, yeah. man. I'm, I'm ex- yeah. Once you hit the two hours, people are like, okay. <laughs> to be honest, I was just I was um, kind of shitting my pants about this whole thing, just because you know we're you know yeah. we're just starting our we're just starting to get some motion here. Yeah, you have ten thousand more likes than we do on <laughs> Facebook. Yeah, you guys, you know you you're serious and. You know, intelligent and well spoken and scares yeah. the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah, I, I guarantee you used about ten words that he didn't know what they were. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm just gonna go past that and well, well, you made, pick yeah. it up later. You made new friends. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had a great time. So did and we. Us too. Riveting stuff. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Cool. Hit the outro for me so I can do the whole shit proper. Hey, you're not yeah. prepared, Hold are on you? One sec. Stuff no, I had my computer muted. Hey, son of a bitch. <laughs> Thought we were being <laughs> a fucking dick. Yeah, well, we had to be. We had to be <laughs> professional for for the most part. So, uh, what do you want, Joiner? Yeah, no, the no, ender. Not that one. Outro. I don't have that one. Oh, you don't. All right, well, do that. That'll be fine. <laughs> um, well, here, this one might be better. That'll that work. one's better. So it's uh, Peter H. Gilmore, Doctor Robert Johnson, uh, Magus. Uh, we didn't talk about that title, really. Well, Anton LaVey was the first one, and I'm the second one in the organization. Where's the title come from? What's the actual... Uh, it's it's older hierarchical things that they've used in sort of uh, occult fraternities. So it's just developed from that. Okay. And Magister, how's that... Uh, what does that tie into as, like... It's like a... Well, that's the fourth degree. I'm the fifth degree. Right. Oh, right. It's, oh, it's, up, it's up there. It's good. One more degree, <laughs> and you get Super Scion, right? Yeah. Is that how that works? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't help but it. But there's only one Magus. <laughs> only one. Well... It's the Church of Satan, uh, churchofsatan.com to find, and you have all your literatures right there to take a look at, you know. Uh, don't judge, just go in and read. And and know. learn. Yeah, learn. I- ignorance is curable. I just realized I do have the outro. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That's the big thing. It's just, you know, have the courage to learn. And, uh, yeah, of, all, of course, uh, Old Nick, Old Nick Magazine. Thank you. Uh, dot com. 
And oh, what's this one? Ooh, that's a great card. <laughs> You're a fancy <laughs> motherfucker. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, oldnickmagazine.com. Uh, Check them out too as, w- as well. You also have um, also look up the uh, Satanic Warlock by Dr. Robert Johnson, and also uh, the Satanic Scriptures by uh, Peter H. Gilmore, and uh, you also the uh, Devil's Reign Three. Daikaiju? Yes. Got it. Yes. <laughs> Pre-order sales begin August 1st. It's our publication of uh, Big Ass Monsters. <laughs> yep. And if you like weird electronic music, my... Ah, uh, uh, yes. Of we course. never got to any of that. Yeah, my symphony <laughs> f- <laughs> um, so, yeah. is, is available. There's plenty of my stuff that you can download on churchofsatan.com. There's a music uh, source page for, for my stuff. But uh, that album is, is now available, and it's uh, sort of very strange electronic music. And you could actually listen to the whole thing. We have a link there. We did a liquid light show to premiere it that had, like, digital stuff and really the old-fashioned liquid light that you project and you yeah. move a thing around. Oh, So cool. we combined those <laughs> techniques and, and played the whole album. So th- we have a link to that so people can listen to the whole thing. Very cool. Some yeah. old-school synth stuff. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I did that when I was a kid, so. Mm, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on, guys. I really appreciate, appreciate it. It's enlightening, to say the least. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah. It's been a great time. Thank Next you. week, anybody? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. The, the answer is yes. I just don't remember who. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll figure that out. Uh, join us next week for someone. Yeah, I'll be promoting. I believe it's a band. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, if you want to wait a sec, I can tell you. Ugh, I don't really want to wait. You don't want to? You don't want to <laughs> wait a sec? Mm, I think we're now I'm trying to take longer just to be a jerk. Uh, Hudson's Crew. They are a band. Ah. All right. Yeah. Hudson's so Crew. So... Google it if you want some information on them because I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Again, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, you we'll guys. see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. And hail Satan. <laughs> yeah, hail Satan. <laughs> so happy I got to say that. <laughs>